Good evening. Welcome to the June 25th, 2024 City Council meeting. We'll start with the prayer. Dear God, today's session opens. We pray that your presence will be before us and everyone who serves in the decision-making process of our city. We pray for direction which will lead our city to be strong and unified. May we continue the legacy of our founders. May we be granted this day the wisdom to make decisions which will be for the good of our city. We also pray for your special blessing on all those who are working to transform our city and make it a better place to live and work. Amen. <clears throat> Salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic which stands, one nation, under God, individual, liberty, and justice for all. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Janess? Here. Councilor Leahy? Here. Councilor Mercia? Here. Councilor Nunn? Here. Councilor Robinson? Here. Councilor uh, Mayor Roll? Here. Councilor Scott? Here. Councilor Yim? Here. Councilor Chow? Here. Councilor Dakota? Here. Councilor Gidge? Here. Eleven. Councilor Mercia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to offer a moment of silence and dock in chamber for Doris E. Forrest Bellet, the beloved wife for 60 years to Norman P. Bellet, who passed away in 2013. Doris was raised in Lowell and attended St. Joseph's High School for Girls and studied classical piano at the Boston Conservatory. In her early years, she worked at Educated Biscuit and Courier Citizen in Lowell. Later in life, she was a saleswoman for Stanley Home Products and was a recipient, uh, I'm sorry, a receptionist for Dr. Lou in Tewksbury. She is survived by her children, Paul Belay and his wife, Janet, Denise Tupin, and her late husband, Charles, Donald Belay and his wife, Andrea, Bernard Belay and his longtime girlfriend, Cindy. We also offer our condolences to his family, relatives, and many friends, as well as her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Uh, I'd like to also offer a moment of silence in docking chamber for Robert Bob J. McMahon, better known as Dad, Gramps, Mr. Mac, Bob, Uncle Bob, these many, many names from all who knew and loved him. He was the best friend and beloved husband of Audrey A. Lavoy McMahon, with whom he had celebrated 59 years of marriage before her passing in 2015. Bob was the son of the late city councilor Francis P. McMahon and Irene McMahon. Bob attended Lowell Public Schools and joined the United States Army in 1955 at age 17. Robert was appointed to a five-year term to the Lowell Housing Authority in 2001, where he served as Commissioner Vice Chairman and Chairman. In 2015, Robert was appointed by Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito and served as Vice Chairman until 2022. He also served as a Rogers Hall board member. Other memberships included Lowell Lodge of Elks, East End Social Club, Lowell and Chemsford Cribbage Leagues, and Longmeadow Golf Club. He supported Friends of Lowell High School Wrestling Program and the Salvation Army. And I want you to listen to this, because I knew this, but this is amazing. Bob and Audrey were married on July 1st, 1956, at Sacred Heart Church in a double wedding ceremony shared with Bob's brother, Gerald, and Audrey's sister, Frances. That was a double wedding. Two brothers married two sisters. I, I found that intriguing. Audrey and Bob were blessed with a large, loving family of one daughter, Doreen McMahon Burgess, who is the right arm assistant executive director to our city manager, Tom Golden, Doreen's husband, Lance and Lance Burgess, his sons, Robert McMahon and his wife, Sheila, Brian and his wife, Erin, Daniel McMahon and his husband, Bill, and Edward M. McMahon and his wife, Victoria, his nine grandchildren, three great-granddaughters, and four great-grandsons. We offer our sympathy to his family, relatives, and many friends. And I'd also like to offer a moment of silence in dock and chamber to all those who passed away since our last city council meeting. May they all rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Leahy? Thank you. I'd like to offer a moment of silence for Thomas G. Manser, 
Uh, Thomas G. Mansa, 64, of Lowell, passed away Sunday, June 16th at Tufts Medical Center in Boston after a long battle with heart disease. He was the husband of Caroline Manser, uh, Caroline Gannam Manser, the father of Christopher and Catherine Manser. He was born April 14th, 1960, son of the late Thomas and the late Gilda Manser. He was raised in Woburn, where he attended local schools. He continued his education at Boston University, later earned a master's degree in business from Southern New Hampshire University. Tom loved spending time with his children, particularly attending the sports events such as football, baseball, field hockey, and tennis. His pride was, was the event when he watched his children play, and he also volunteered to assist where needed we flipped a lot of hamburgers at the uh, Lowell High games. Um, his last uh, volunteer was working with Cele uh, Celebrates Kerouac, Kerouac Committee. Uh, Tom be missed by many friends and, and uh, countless friends throughout the city. Uh, I'd like to offer a moment of silence for him. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Matt Clark, please call dinner lights. May they all rest in peace. We're on uh, Mayor's Business 2.1, Communication Remote, Zoom Participation, Motion to Accept a Place on File by Councilor Chow, seconded by Councilor Gitcha. All in favor say aye. Opposed, motion passes. Th Section 3, City Clerk 3.1, Minutes of the Public Safety Subcommittee, June 11th, City Council Regular Meeting, June 11th, for acceptance. Motion to accept a place on file by Councilor Janess, second by Councilor Leahy. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, motion passes. Councilor Mercia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to suspend the rules and allow for a, a 12.1 to come in. Uh, it's a petition uh, by Francis Draper. She'd like to address the council. Motion by Councilor Mercia to take 12.1 out of order. Second by Councilor Yem. All in favor say aye. Opposed? Mr. Mayor, can we add 12.4 to that 12 as well? 12.4 as well by Councilor Janess. Uh, all in favor say aye. Opposed? Passes. We'll do 12.1. Since we're on a suspension rule, we'll also take a 8.3 out of order as well afterward. Sure. Yeah, thank you. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get to all the out of orders, um, no problem at all. We'll start with 12.1, uh, miscellaneous. Uh, Mr. Francis Draper requests us, uh, uh, to address council regarding walkability at the intersection of East Meadow and Mammoth Road. Mrs. Draper? Good evening, all. Thank you for having me. Uh, I um, did this petition to um, for a safety reason. I live at the corner of Mammoth Road and East Meadow. As you all know, that's a uh, very highly congested four-way intersection. Uh, we have quite a few accidents. In the last month, I think we had two or three. So I consider that a lot. And the bus stops there, uh, it's just very ha heavily used. Anyway, um, uh, people cannot walk on the sidewalk for two reasons. On my side of East Meadow Road, I have tried to maintain it, but because of the, the rain, the water flows right down and just washes away. I've put dirt there and sand there, all kinds of stuff, and I've been there about 20 years. Across the street, uh, as you, some of you may know, there's two buildings that have been recently built there. And when the uh, owner of the property built the, built the homes, he included in his property the sidewalk. So he has, you know, those bumpers that go around the street and all that, and you see them in parking lots. Well. It does meet right into the street, but between his property line and the street property line, that walk there, he has that bump there. So when people are walking, if they don't see it, they fall down or they get hurt. It's down a good three, four, maybe even more inches. He was supposed to fill it, which it never got done. So now, I, you know, it's a very dangerous situation, and it goes up and down and up and down. I have been watching people walk down the street they try to walk on my side till they get to a certain place, but then the gully just goes down, it's dropped so much. On his side of the street, they have to actually walk in the street. And you can imagine how dangerous that is as they come around that corner, the cars, the trucks, the buses, and all this and that. 
I've seen a mother pick up her child that's, you know, those little cars, they push them and they ride them, actually have to pick them up and go in the street because of that lump there. And they walk maybe 10 feet and then they get another one and more and another one. So there's two areas there that are extremely, extremely dangerous. And that's uh, why I'd like you to consider uh, my street uh, beca because it is, it is a real safety problem. And the other thing is you can't really tell uh, as to where it is at night. It is so dark, it's not lit up. So that makes it even a, another dangerous thing. And we have a lot of traffic now that those two other homes are there because they're partly business and that these trucks are backing in and out. So as, and it's so close to the Mammoth Road intersection that when you're coming out or backing in, it's very easy to, you know, to get hit. Uh, let's see. Well, that's about it. I'm, I've seen, you can't, you can't walk there with wheelchairs uh, or canes because the, the ground is so uneven, and bicycles, and even with pets, I see people in the street. People have stopped me, because I've gone out there, you know, I'm out there in my yard, and they said, you didn't do much this year in the <laughs> sidewalk. I says, I've been here for over 20 years, and I says, I'm 80 now, I just can't do it anymore, you know? So that's really why it's, I think it's a real safety problem. And I'd like you to, you know, consider it and hopefully get it fixed as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Street. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Cousin uh, 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 Francis, could you just say, say your name and address for the record oh, for the yes. city clerk? Francis M. Draper, 359 Mammoth Road, Lowell 01854. Okay. You need thank my you. telephone number? No, no, great <laughs> job. Thank you very much. Okay, and thank you for considering. You got it. The yeah, motion to uh, refer to traffic Transportation engineer for a report recommendation by Council Gitche, second by Council Mercia. All in favor say aye. Opposed passes. 12.4 miscellaneous. Warren Griff requests permission to speak to City Council regarding the issuing of building permits in the city. Sir? Hello. My name is Warren Greif. I reside at 15 Kearney Square, uh, right here in Lowell. I would like to petition the Council to develop a policy whereby building permits would not be awarded to real estate developers with a demonstrable history of unacceptable practices. These to include, but not be limited to, one, an established history of shoddy work and dissatisfied customers and clients. Two, a patent disregard for the health, safety, and general welfare of their workers, customers, and surrounding neighborhoods, such as recklessly incautious handling of hazardous materials, the intentional disarming of safety mechanisms, etc. Three, a record of wil willfully ignoring rules, regulations, legal restrictions, and well-established norms. Four, a demonstrated lack of competence when it comes to complying with legal requirements and adhering to adequate development standards. Five, a demonstrated lack of concern for the well-being of the community and the welfare of its citizens. I believe there are excellent examples of high quality development here in the city of Lowell. Lamentably, this is not always the case, which is most unfortunate for the city as a whole, as well as the individual residents who are directly affected and deserve to be protected. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, sir. Councilor Robinson. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the speaker. I I have to say I like this idea, and I believe last term, didn't we discuss um, some kind of list, creating some kind of list for landlords that um, kind of did not take care of their properties, repeat offenders, and we looked at um, not issuing permits for any kind of work for those landlords that were neglectful of their properties, repeat offenders, of course. Um, maybe this is something to kind of look along those lines. Thank you. So we need a motion to refer to the city manager for a report recommendation by Councillor Janess, second by Councillor Gitchia. All those in favor say aye. Passes. Councillor Chow, what did you have? Um, uh, motion to, um, since you're on the motion to suspend the rule, could you please also take 8.3 out of order? 8.3 by Councillor Chow, second by Councillor Leahy. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, motion passes. 8.3 communication appointments to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging committee. Uh, pursuant to the author invested in the city manager, uh, the appointment of the following persons to serve uh, on the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee. Uh, we have the, the following names, all to be appointed this evening. 
Annabelle Dominguez, Tiana Lawrence, Elizabeth Gonzalez, Rafael Cotto, Roberto Dai, Caitlin Schutzbach, I hope I get that right, Caitlin, sorry, uh, Captain Marisol Nobrega, Mona Tyree, um, Holosa da Dacuna, and Gordon Hum. Uh, all terms shall expire July 9th, 2025. We need a motion to adopt by Councilor Janess, second by Councilor Gitchia. Roll call. Madam Clerk. Councilor Janess? Yes. Council Leahy? Yes. Council Mercia? Yes. Council Nunn? Yes. Council Robinson? Yes. Mayor Rock? Yes. Council Scott? Yes. Council Yem? Yes. Council Chow? Yes. Council Dakota? Yes. Council Gitchia? Yes. 11 years. On behalf of uh, the City Council, uh, myself, the Mayor, we thank you all for serving on this very important committee. Mr. Mayor. Councilor Gitchia, you have something? Could we also take motion uh, 7.16 out of order, please, Mr. Mayor? Motion by Councilor Gitchia, take 716 out of order. Second by Councilor Mercer. All the fair say aye. Opposed, motion passes. Councilor Gitchia, request the city manager have the Lowell Police Department increase patrol in the area of Favor Street and Appleton Street from 5 a.m. to 3 p.m. each day. Second by Councilor Janess. Councilor Gitchia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do we have anybody registered to speak, Madam, Madam Clerk? Clerk? Brandon Wright, 201 Middlesex Street. Go ahead. Um, Brandon Wright, uh, 201 Middlesex Street. And guys, excuse me if I come off as a little, like, uh, I guess, antagonistic, um, kind of going through it. I stay at the Lowell Transitional Living Center. So the, some of these issues are really, really personal to me. Um, it's more of an indictment on the system than it is to you guys on the council. And I just want you guys to know that when I get up here and speak the way that I do. It's directed at the system as a whole in the way that it is um, and how I find it unacceptable. Um, so instead of increasing patrols, how about increasing services? As we all discuss Band-Aid solutions to an unprecedented crisis, the fact remains true that we need a sprawling facility that is well-funded, well-staffed, uh, perhaps on-site satellite offices of the many incredible agencies in Lowell, uh, that directly cares and caters to the needs of the people who find themselves homeless or otherwise, you know, on the street. A true uh, public-private community par partnership that offers day programs for growth, development, and leisure activities, as well as employment and training opportunities rather than somewhere to sleep, <sighs> then it's out the door until some arbitrary time determined by some out-of-touch executives in Framingham. <laughs> Not necessarily their fault. Proximity f plays a factor, but a lack of communication and funding certainly play large roles in this as well. We need to create a space that is welcoming and nurturing to the mind, body, and soul, as far too many souls have been lost going through the spellbinding maze of the system as currently constituted. I'm, si I'm simply just one of the lucky survivors. A, I call it a veteran of domestic war. And with the same courtesy and respect you would sh treat any other veteran, you should treat us the same. I personally have been to hell and back 81 times due to abuse, neglect, flat out greed, and the under prioritization of true justice for us in almost every system. Political, injustice, medical, you name it. The fact remains true that if you happen to fall under a certain socioeconomic threshold, it is a big forget you and the horse you rode in on. In fact, while I'm, while I'm on the subject, we should be naming streets and putting up monuments in honor of those of whom who have shed their blood, sweat, and tears and who have lost their lives in this struggle. A great exa example of this, and you, you all probably know him, uh, Shannon Lally. Uh, along with the other countless Llewellyans who have lost their lives wandering in the wilderness, wilderness of despair, having no hopes for their futures whatsoever. And I was one of them, so I understand this. But I digress. If, if we can find a way to build a $300 million courthouse facility, we can find a way to make this a reality. 
It's a matter of priorities. Is human capital worth it? Are human lives worth it? Um, am I not a prime example of the benefits of never giving up on someone, despite how far they, they reach their lows? Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. I don't know. That's based on opinion. But I will say that there are many people living on the street in an emergency shelter for years on end that would benefit from such an outpouring of support and can ill afford the status quo, business as usual, current state of affairs. The general, the general sentiment in Lowell, Massachusetts, the United States, and worldwide should be, what are we going to do for these people rather than what are we going to do with these people? And again, uh, like I said last time, if you'd like to bring us into the conversation, you know where we're at, you have my contact information, and I invite you all to come speak with us at the, at the Lowell Transitional Living Center. And thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Shanahan. My name is Mary Beth Shanahan, and I'm the, my husband and I own the Al Diner. And we're not here to point, I'm not here tonight to point fingers because I know things are being done. People are trying to make a solution to the problem, but it seems to be getting out of hand. And I think we need a better solution. Um, I grew up, my mother died <clears throat> when I was nine, and I know what it is to be cold. I know what it is not to have food. So when I see these kids going by that are having problems, I say to myself, that's somebody's child. I don't say there's, there's a drug addict, there's, there's an alcoholic. The problem, I think, is mental health. We, you hit the nail on the head. We need more facilities. We need more places for these people to go to get the help they need. Not everybody up there is an alcoholic or using drugs. There are just people that have lost their way and they need somebody to help them find it. And right now, I want you to help me be able to run my business a lot easier than what we're going through. But I also want you to be able to come up with a solution to help these people. And the church, I know, feeds them and everything, but <clears throat> they're not, I don't think they're keeping, they're inside. I don't think they're out there doing, doing what they could do. Yes, they are feeding them, and I see them go in. We went by Saturday night, and there's a guy all tucked in for the night at 7 o'clock in the doorways. Somebody bought that Elliott School. You probably know who. Um, how is he going to put apartments in there and be able to have people rent them? And you know what the rents are now. So what's going to happen there? Is that just going to stay fenced off for a long time, or is something going to be done so that he can make that building better? So thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Councilor Gitche. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I bring this to your attention because I know that it has been brought to your attention. We once had a mobile unit that we could put in places in monitor areas. We do have businesses over there who are struggling and losing business daily. And, and I just want to address a few things that were said. The speaker had said, what are we going to do for these people? I don't know of another city or town in Massachusetts that has tried harder than the city of Lowell and this council at doing things for these people. I once had an uncle who was homeless who went through the drug addiction, who went through everything also. So it's not like it hasn't affected all of our families too, or doesn't still continue to affect our families. We care. What are we going to do for jobs? Well, I don't see in Drake, it, Tewksbury, Chelmsford, or any surrounding communities a workforce development program. I don't see career centers. I don't see social security. I don't see a shelter. I don't see anything that's going on on Summer Street in their communities. So what are we going to do for these people? What are you going to do for these people? Are you going to go to the State House and start lobbying for us in Lowell? I haven't seen any of the speakers at the State House yet. If we all understand government, that's where the funding comes from, the State House. The State House is the only one who can help solve this crisis. They have the funds. The federal government, where, where are people writing to the Congresswoman? Where are people? 
but they stand up here and they tell us we're not doing it. Well, it takes a team and it takes leadership to try to solve these issues. And our job at this current time is to try to help out our businesses in the area and try to say, okay, we do have these services. We did offer these services as the manager has stated over and over and over again. I'm compassionate, I'm as compassionate as anybody in here. I think we all are. But now I have businesses calling me saying that they're losing business, that people are doing things in their parking lots, that they can't manage these things and they're open between these hours. So that's the question is how do we short-term manage this and we're giving long-term solutions. We've had the homeless coordinator here how many times in the last two and a half years that I've been here, that all of you have been here. Most of us were fairly new at that time. Every single person on this council wants the solution. If somebody has that solution, please help us. We, we're, we're here. But when you put all the social services in within a half a mile block, where do you think people are gonna go for the services? There's parties down on the South Common every single day. So now it's our job to manage it through our police force and through other avenues. We will offer the services that we have here and we have offered readily through our homeless and through the walks that Mr. Manager, you've highlighted every single time a speaker has come here, we've highlighted what we've done. And when you hear people say, what are we gonna do for these people? The city of Lowell has done for these people. What is the state gonna do for us? What are the other communities gonna do for us? When, it, when are we all gonna band and say, okay, let's get the state back here? When are we all gonna band together and say, let's get the federal government here? And, that, and I mean, it's going on throughout the country. And, and Mr. Manager, this motion was just about small business, trying to stay in business, a family business, a well reputation business who does the Salvation Army. They do every single charity that this city offers, that family does for all of us. And all they're asking for is a little bit of help during these period of time to try to get people off. We have former mayors calling. I just spoke to a, a, a former mayor, former high school headmaster in the other room who said his grandchildren won't even go down there mm -hmm. to eat in the restaurant that they ate at since they were born. And that's what the question comes down. I had another former mayor call me and really push, please help these people. So as we help these people, there's these people too. So we gotta find that balance. And, and I thank you for everything you're about to do and, and hopefully we can make this correction as soon as possible. Thank you. How's it, Robinson? Thank you. Um, seems good like just here having this conversation. This is the same area, South Common. I think, as my colleague stated, a lot of this mental health is a shortage created by the state, leaving host communities like ours to dig ourselves out of a hole, which we can't even keep our head above water. As we've kind of identified the problems that are going on in the community, one thing we really have to be cognitive of, two separate issues. Yes, I fully agree, we need mental health services. State, we need you, and we've uttered those words on repeat a million times over. Yes, we need more substance abuse treatment facilities. Again, state, well aware, we've knocked on that door a million times over. All these services don't necessarily have to be in Lowell by any stretch. We've held summits where we invited everybody in to see if they were willing to pick up a little bit of this burden, see if they could pull a little bit of this weight that we've been struggling to try to keep our head above water with and to no avail. The vagrancy piece though is what I think we need to key in on because whether it's substance abuse, substance use, whether it's mental illness, whatever it may be, vagrancy and crime is vagrancy and crime. And I think that's what's impacting a lot of our small businesses. People utilizing parking spaces to hide and, and do their drugs or whatever else is going on over there. That's not something that I think any community is gonna take a stand and say, it's okay, this person's sick. Well, listen, if that person's sick, Let's give them help. If they don't want the help and they continue that behavior in our public space and it's impacting our businesses, well then I think we have to look at our policing. Now it seemed like last summer we were starting to finally get a grip 
in this area, this is the ground zero as we're all aware in the business district, pretty much from the shelter all the way to the train station and it just seems to keep expanding. Whatever happened to change what we had a grip on last summer, night and day from this summer. South Common Pool, we were talking about that. We have businesses saying they are struggling in that area and people are refusing to go eat at establishments that they've been bringing their family to for 30 years. What makes you think in your right mind that you're gonna bring a family of little children down to this pool to swim? I mean, are we gonna keep talking about this while I drove by today? There was just as many tents there today as there's been ever. I don't see the results of anybody enforcing these kind of things. It's one thing if you need help. And I think our outreach and co-op people are exhausted. I, I, I hope they have a, a boot and shoe allowance built into what they do because they cover a lot of ground on a daily basis. And, and how long are we gonna continue to turn a blind eye and not react? I mean, yes, the speaker was passionate explaining those that have fell on hard times and have had to battle as a veteran, as he put it, to claw themselves out of that hole, grab that hand that's been extended. We're continuously extending our hand and, and, and thank you for grabbing that hand and, and being living proof that there is a way out and we're gonna continue to offer that hand. But to those that keep smacking that hand, as I said before, I think we really need to have a serious conversation and, and, and bring in the police and bring in whoever else needs be. Because when we're seeing business owners, I mean, as I've only been here for two and a half years. I've never one time seen the owners of this business come. It's another one to add to the, the, the checklist. I mean, we've heard from, you name it, the list is getting a mile long. And so please, I'm pleading. What can we do with our law enforcement and surrounding agencies to really figure out, at very minimum, get a grip on this vagrancy and the crime that's running rampant in that area? And for those that need the help, maybe we start looking to add to our outreach program with people like the speaker that just spoke tonight, that's living proof that services do work when you're willing to take that first step. I think those are the kind of people that can connect with the community and show them that it's not all about talk. None of us here have gone through those hard times. So maybe we need to approach this different and bring people that are trusted in the community that clawed their way out themselves and extend their hand themselves to help those that want to help themselves. Thank you. All in favor say aye. Opposed? No. Motion. Oh. Council Mercia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm probably going to be redundant because what I'm going to say, I've said it before. Talking about the homeless situation is a good thing. It's good to get this out because I want people to know that the city of Lowell is second to none when it comes to services and everything that can be done for the homeless is being done. There's only so much you can do though. Do you think that we can get an ap apartment for a drug addict who can't even take care of themselves, but we're gonna put them in an apartment to take care of an apartment? That's not gonna happen. We, we talking, talking is good, but we're asking for solutions and people that come up to speak, they, they mean well, they're saying things that we're, we're listening to, but they're not giving you the answer. I'm gonna tell you what I feel is the answer and I don't know everything and maybe I'm wrong. These people that are out on the street need to be out of the street. They need to be put in a facility separated by their addiction. You can't put a drug addict with, a, with an alcoholic, but there should be a big building with people supervising, making sure that the mentally ill are taking their medication. They will be whole people. They will be totally different people if they're on their medication and people are supervising them. That is what I say, that is what we need, but I don't see that happening. I don't see the state or the federal government coming forward trying to help. The majority of people that you're seeing in the city do not even live here. I know this because I talk to them. They're from Framingham, they're from Worcester, they're from Bedford, they're from Revere. I know because I see them and I say, well, where are you from? Oh, I come from Worcester, uh, I'm in this city and the city of Lowell 
It, it's like, did you miss it? Because it's like a neon sign that is saying, come to Lowell, we'll give you free food, we'll, we'll, we, you can sleep in the park, we'll, we'll do everything we can to kick you out, but in 10 minutes you can get back there. It's very, very frustrating. And, I, and when it gets to the point where we're seeing businesses that gave their sweat, blood, tears, and hard work, and they've been here over 30 years in the community where every person that you could think of has eaten there at one point or another and they're coming up before us saying help us we got to get these people away from our business they're sleeping in our lots they're sleeping at our doorstep this is unacceptable the people at a businesses pay more than the taxpayer pays they pay double for what we pay so we're cutting into our own, we're slitting our own throat is what we're doing. I have compassion for people too, but we gotta realize that they need supervision. And let's not overlook the fact that they're going to the bathroom. How, how would you like a sandwich or a breakfast at the Owl Diner and you're looking out the window and someone pulled their pants down and went to the bathroom? Don't tell me it isn't happening. I've seen it myself. I worked there on that street. I've seen people having sex because their drug addicts does not curb their desire to do these things. You see that. Is this what this city is all about? We need someone to come forward and say, we're gonna get a building for you. We're gonna stock it with people that are gonna supervise the people so they're not out hurting each other over a love affair that this one's going with that one. And I, I'm gonna, I know a woman that is a knifer and she's knifed, I don't know, three people already. And she threatened me. So I, I don't know what to tell you, I, but I know that I deal with this on a daily basis. I see it. We give them clothes. They come back the next day. Their clothes are stolen. It's a vicious cycle. We need a facility. I don't know how to stress that, but this is only one business. You're gonna move them from the South Common to somewhere else, and it'll be another business coming up here saying, please help us, we're going out of business. We're not gonna put up with this anymore. I don't see the surrounding communities helping us. I really don't. And the organizations that are out there are doing the best that they can. God bless them, but, and some do not want help. I understand because, they don't want help because if they're in a facility, they can't do their drugs. I, I'm telling you the truth. So I'm very frustrated. I know the Shanahan's are frustrated. We got to do something to help our businesses. Thank you. All in favor say aye. Opposed, motion passes. That being 7 o'clock. Wait for the public hearing. 5.1, ordinance, meet, amend, fee schedule. Ordinance amending the Code of Ordinances of the City of Lowell, Massachusetts with respect to Chapter 150 there of Entitled Fees by amending certain sections. We'll start the meeting up by those in favor, in favor, in favor. The portion of the meeting is closed. Those in opposition, opposition, opposition. That portion of the meeting is closed. The motion to adopt by Councilor Yem, seconded by Councilor Janess. Roll call. Councilor Janess. Yes. Council Leahy? Yes. Council Mercia? Yes. Council Nunn? Yes. Council Robinson? Yes. Mayor Rock? Yes. Council Scott? Yes. Council Yim? Yes. Council Chow? Yes. Council Dakota? Yes. Council Gitchia? No. Ten years. Passes. Moving on. Six utility public hearing, six point one. National Grid Verizon New England requests installation of one Jopo on Boston Road. I uh, need a second reading. Again. Check it. Okay. Can you read the next one? Second reading. Um, 6.1 again. National Grid requests installation of one Jopo on Boston Road. The you know, motion to refer to wire inspector for a report recommendation by Council Gitches, second by Council Janess. Comments? All those in favor say aye. Passes. 6.2. National Grid Request Installation of Underground Electric Conduit at Foundry, Quebec, and Plain Streets. Uh, second reading is the same uh, request installation of the conduit. Need a motion to refer to wire inspector for a report by Council Jeanette, second by Council Lee. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Uh, and, and my motion by Council Lee to take 7.15 out of order, seconded by Council Noon. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Motion passes. 
715. I screwed that 61 and 62 up. Um, 61, back to that one again. You have to open it up for those in favor. In favor, sir, go ahead. Go ahead. You want to speak on 61? Go ahead. Can I speak uh, opposed? Those in favor, in favor, motion, uh, okay. motion meeting is closed. Those are speaking in opposition, go ahead. Can I speak in opposition? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I apologize. My name is Jack Paley. I own the Foundry Industrial Park, which is on Foundry Street. Um, you'll pardon me, my hearing isn't all that great. No but problem at all. There are a number of mistakes, and we're very, very concerned about access. So, I interrupt you, sir. So, what we're doing is, all we did, we just referred to an inspector for a recommendation. So, we haven't approved anything yet. No, I understand. Yeah. Can I, should I mention my concerns? I was up at the engineer's office, and they said it would be appropriate. Absolutely. To yes, give sir. my, uh, okay. So, I guess my concern is in talking with the power company, they said that Foundry Street may be blocked because of the way they're doing this as an underground vault. There are approximately 120 trucks a day that go in there. There's 20 businesses, among them Beacon Roofing Supply, Standard Electric, Turin Williams. And if that street is blocked, as they're talking about doing, you will basically put the Foundry Industrial Park out of business. So what I'm asking the council is, I think it's reasonable, is if you vote in favor of it, ask the power company to guarantee access on this street. It's only 20 feet wide. I'm an engineer, I grew up in Lowell, I've been an engineer most of my adult life. It shouldn't be a problem, but we're very concerned that if they block Foundry Street, which is essentially a dead end street, it's the only way in and out, there's no alternate way in and out of the street we're going to have an incredible problem, and it will have an economic effect. The other issues, which may be minor, but I'll bring it to the council's attention, it says that there are no sidewalks, but there are sidewalks. I have a picture of the sidewalks if anyone wants to see it, but Foundry Street does have a sidewalk, and I mean, it's unclear to me why they say there's no sidewalk on the front page of this, and I apologize, I know this is probably not a big deal to the council, but to us, if they block access to the industrial park, it's going to be a mess. So the, okay, the only other thing, I don't want to take the council's time, is we have an easement on the power company land to park, which we've had for 20 years, and we've been told verbally that, yeah, it might be okay, but mm, maybe it won't be okay. So all I'm asking is that if the council votes on it either tonight or in the future, that it just say that Foundry Street, which is a city street, will stay open and accessible, which in my opinion as an engineer is not a big deal, and they might be doing that anyways. I just don't want them to show up one day and have them say, oh, we've blocked the street, have a nice life. The other thing we're asking for is, um, I believe there's some small mistakes here, and I could meet with them. One of the small problems in talking to the city engineer, and I'll finish up, I know this is really boring and silly, is it's very hard to read these plans because they come in in a PDF format and and even the engineer said, we really can't see it. And I said, listen, it's a small point, but you've got it as plain road and it's plain street. You've got no sidewalk. I said, yeah, I guess there is a sidewalk. As I said, if I don't think anyone really cares, but me, I'm just concerned about this. And if the council in its um, jurisdiction would just say, yeah, the street has to stay open. We still have to have access to our power company parking, and I don't know what they want to do with the sidewalk, and I don't really care, but there is a sidewalk, and whether they're going to replace it with concrete or not really doesn't matter to me, but somebody should be aware of it. Yeah. So all, Sorry I mean, to take your time. I know nope, this is not very a valid concern, sir. All we did today was just refer it for an opinion, uh, and again, the city manager will meet you right now before you leave here. 
to just talk about all those concerns and it'll come back to us again for a public hearing for approval and they'll be posted and come back for that and anything else okay. that you were concerned about. Yeah, and I'm specific. sorry, I know there's oh, more important no, no, things no. to do, but. It's it's a very, very good job, Satan Case. Thank you for your time. Yes, sir. Thank you very he's much. Gonna, he's meeting you right there. Yeah. Oh, great. He's meeting you out there. So those have both been referred to a wire inspector for uh, an opinion and now uh, come back. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Yep. Go ahead, Council Lee. So quick question. If, if we're still on the suspension, there's someone here to speak on 7.15. I don't know if we can take that out. That's what I had going on, yes. Okay, so thank you. by Council Lee, speak on 7.15. Second by Council Mercia. All the fair say aye. Opposed motion passes 7.15. Council Lee, request the amendment to set up a neighborhood meeting with Douglas Road residents to discuss <coughs> paving project. Seconded by Council Mercia, Council Alihi. Uh, we have one registered speaker, Mrs. Littlefield. Helen Littlefield. Hi, Helen Littlefield, 249 Douglas Road in Lowell. Very quickly, my husband, our neighbors, and I would like to have a meeting with the appropriate city officials to learn more about the plans to repave our part of Douglas Road and to offer our input about the project. So to that end, I hope that you will all support Council Leahy's motion. Thank you. Council Leahy. Thank you. Um, the motion pretty much speaks for itself. There's just some concern about um, how we're going to repave the road, the direction of the uh, runoff, and what we would like to do. So if we could set up a meeting sooner than later, it would be appreciated. Thank you. How's it get you? And I agree with Council Leahy is one of the concerns is that the separation, sewer separation issues down there and, you know, what are we going to do prior to paving it? Because it doesn't make sense to pave this if within the five year period we're going to start separating stuff or is this part of that whole project? It may all be the same thing. So I think that's good for the neighbors to understand where we're going. Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Three to the Council. Council is, uh, and of course, to the, to the neighbors in that area. We've been thinking about this. Uh, this particular area, and I don't want to speak to numbers because actually our transportation engineer is is off today, uh, but knows about this. Our engineer knows about this, and this is going to be a certain section that will not be uh, uh, influenced by the CSO area. Uh, but we're trying to do some paving in an area that is just um, it's in really rough shape. So I think it is uh, very warranted that we meet uh, with the traffic engineer as well as our engineer. But um, to that point, the CSO, that will not be uh, impacted in that particular area. So that's absolutely uh, easy enough to do, and we'll have that probably next week before the 4th. Uh, the traffic engineer will be back if we can squeeze that in, if not right after the 4th, if that's okay. All in favor say aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Anything else out of order before we continue with the agenda? No? All good? Actually, I apologize. We have one more public speaker left. Um, motion by Council Newton takes 7.4 out of order. Uh, seconded by Council Janess. Um, all in favor say aye. Opposed motion passes. 7.4. Council Newton, Council Janess requests the manager create a task force to work with the Lowell Police Department to research possible tactics to stop the gangs of motor scooters, motorbikes, and motorcycles that are recklessly endangering themselves and others. Explore possible use of cameras, unmarked cars, and other techniques. No second needed. Gentlemen. Mr. Mayor, do we have a speaker? Brendan Wright. Hey guys. Uh, all right. So uh, first of all, I want to address another issue just real quick. Um, I, I have to say this. Um, management at uh, LTC should honestly be ashamed of themselves for. Sir, um, just, uh, we're, so we're on 7.4. Just okay. Stick to, the motion. Stick to it. Yep. All right. I'll, I'll have to bring this forward again. But yeah, they know why. Anyways, uh, 7.4. So. Obvious signs of needs for services, such as seeing people sparring on the streets and opening boxing gyms, or skateboarding in public spaces during the 90s and the sub subsequent opening of skate parks, were, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, perhaps we should explore similar options and pursue different funding opportunities and partnerships to create a safer environment in which Lowellians are able to participate in activities such as these or any other. These things clearly bring us joy and an area designated uh, exclusively for the purposes of uh, leisurely off-road vehicle activities is no different. If we can find a way, again, to build a $300 million courthouse facility, we can find a way to make this also a reality, or at least, you know, put forth the effort in trying to do so. 
it's a matter of priorities. Um, apparently, we seem to think it's a better idea to invest in these types of things instead of doubling down on vital human services um, as we've sat back and watched service agencies that are on life support and eliminated altogether, similar to like uh, life connections, uh, go out of business. And to me, that's a travesty that greatly affects us all. I know these are somewhat different issues, but to me, it's human services. Um, leisure is part of that. So um, my apologies if I'm a bit off topic. Um, here's an effective tactic you can create a task for, force around. And one of the best features of it, it doesn't involve in grand, uh, branding a group of people with a common hobby as a gang. I was shocked when I read that. Um, it also doesn't demonize and criminalize having a good time. Now their idea of a good time does indeed put the safety of others at risk. I get it. However, it really doesn't need to be through uh, police inter intervention, arrests, fines, or whatever other soup du jour punitive measures you happen to decide to employ. Is a real solution cameras and unmarked cars? To me, this general attitude and language brands kids as a public menace um, and it only serves to margin marginalize people who are already marginalized. And it's a dangerous precedent to set. Councilor Noon, um, I'm sorry I have a, a lot of respect for you. Mr. Wright, three, three minutes is up. Can you please wrap it up? Three minutes. Okay, yeah, it's right, one last paragraph right here. Um, to me, it's rather ironic and surprising to see that you co sponsored this motion, seeing as though you agree with the fact that we cannot arrest our way out of um, issues such as this. Um, that you brought up homelessness in the past. Uh, sy systems predicated on punishment rather than positive nurturing encouragement are truly toxic ultimately destined for and ultimately destined for chaos. An example of this on a mass scale would be the so-called war on drugs. But I'll, I'll stop there and um, again, um, it should be what are we going to do for these people rather than what are we going to do with these people. Thank you very much. Council Thank, Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The behavior of a group of biker who terrorize a city, not just district, the whole city. Every year, this council, if you ask Councilor Mercia, how many years she's been here? About that, every year, this time of the, the year. Not just, my, not just in front of my house, in front of other people's house too. And they said, what are you guys going to do about it? And we look around and say, it's not much we can do. Well, there, there are things we can do. Can't be throwing our arm up and say, nothing we can do. I understand that we have a policy and the right policy of no pursuit. Because it put not only that individual life at risk, but also the innocent people, pedestrian and other drivers and stuff. Every day. I hear complain about this. It's enough, it's enough. There's a way we can do, maybe, yes, out there and looking at, because a lot of those bite, they are not registered and they're not insured. I wonder how many of those bites are insured. If one person, you can have a bite, you can drive with your friend, but you have to respect the rule of the road. It's enough, it's enough. That's right. Do I respect someone who do that? Who terrorize the community like that? No, I don't. Respect going both ways, not one way. You have to respect the resident and the community that you live next door to. Because the children live there. I see kid cross the street on Pine Street. The police precinct's right there. Three bikes came and they just lift their bike up and just go. And the kid just, their, their parents just pulled the kid to the side as if to protect their kid over themselves. And that's why I filed this motion. I was, gonna, I was not going to say anything. I was going to say the motion, the motion speaks for itself. But you all know. You all can attest to this. Everyone sitting in this chamber 
No, that is the problem. Every year, this time of the year. Right. Councilor Janess. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to touch on a couple of quick things that, that came up as part of this conversation. Thing one is the Police Athletic League. The police do, do work with our youth and give them opportunities to do things um, to keep them out of trouble, whether it's boxing, basketball, or other opportunities. Those exist within the city. This council has fostered those. This administration has fostered those. This is a specific small group of people who insist on, on terrorizing the rest of the city, for lack of a better term. This happens downtown. This happens in the neighborhoods. I was walking home from the garage last week, and there was a kid flying up Market Street, wheeling a quad in the middle of Market Street. There's no reason for that. The police have the non-pursuit policy so that no one gets hurt. Think that's the right way to go because I don't want to see any of the kids who are on these bikes or any other bystander have an incident because it could have tragic consequences. But I do want to make sure that we give the police the tools they need in order to try to rein this in. This is not just a Lowell problem either. This happens in cities across the state and across the country. It's a common issue that many departments and cities are trying to figure out and deal with. Um, Councilor Noon mentioned that most of these aren't registered. They aren't insured. I would hazard to guess that most of these aren't even owned by the people who are riding them. We've heard time and time again that a large portion of the bikes being used in this way are stolen. I don't know how we can just let them run around our city. We have to figure out a better way to protect everyone. I'm not interested in arresting our way out of this problem. I'm interested in figuring out how we make this problem go away. I don't, if anyone has a suggestion, I'm all ears to it. Thank you. Councilor Robinson. Thank you. A um, Couple of things real quick. I think it was about a week ago, Councilor Gitche and myself were downtown grabbing something to eat, and um, we were on Middle Street. A patrol car was on Merrimack. A kid came down, I believe it's, what's the street the coffee mill's on? Kid came down Palmer from Merrimack the wrong way, flying, and there was a woman walking a little dog, puppy, coming from Middle, turning up. He narrowly missed the woman and her dog by probably a foot. On the sidewalk, he hopped that corner and took off because he saw the patrol car coming. They weren't chasing him, and thank God they weren't, because who knows how that could have ended. These problems with, with the motorbikes, again, we're, we're all clear. They can't chase. I'd like, I think we need to see, for one thing this council did push, are the gas stations abiding by not filling, which is something that we had a recommendation, and I think it's time to revisit and see are they abiding by this policy that we implemented to make sure that that's one other tool that, that was brought to our attention. I'd also like to point out um, <clears throat> for immediate release came out June 9th, 2022. Merrimack Valley Reckless Bike is Task Force, and that's not just a low thing, as, as my colleagues have mentioned. Um, the primary agencies participated in this collaboration are the Low Police Department, Lawrence Police Department, Andover Police Department, Chelmsford Police Department, Dragon Police Department, Methuen Police Department, Tewksbury Police Department, and the Tingsboro Police Department. I'd like to know through you, maybe to the chief, or, or, or maybe they, it comes back on the report, or whatever it may be, is this um, task force still active? Are they still collaborating together? And um, maybe it's time to, to bring these people back to the table and see what are some of the, the things they're finding in other communities are working and what are some of the things that aren't. So thank my colleagues for bringing this forward. Councilor Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd also like to um, clarify something that's been said a few times, that these are children 
or young children or and and they're not that's not what I'm seeing at all seeing at all I mean I've seen some young children on homemade um, dirt bikes I don't think that's what anyone is talking about here when they're talking about the gang mentality um, this is a group that's been arrogant and defiant they've been running through red lights they've been putting people you know driving down the wrong lane um, I certainly don't think that we're talking about young children here that you know need additional opportunities um, and I just want to make sure that we're clear on that um, with everybody out there so and this just definitely needs to stop it definitely is it's a social gang it's um, I don't think they're all coming from the city I think they're coming I see them coming in across the town line I live on the town line um, so we definitely have to we have to do something I don't know the solution to this but it, it's definitely dangerous thank you all in favor say aye. Opposed, motion passes. Return to the agenda, section four, out of the business, 4.1, communication. Low FY23 financial statement. Low FY23. SEFA and low FY23 management letter. Motion to accept and place on file by Council Mercia, second by Council Noon. Any questions? Council Gitcha. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Manager Golden. On the management letter, it says June 30th, 2023 is when it was given in the front page. But then when you go in it, you see under the school department, it references the, um, the, the report from the Abrams Group report on April 10th, 2024, on page two of it. So is this up to date information or is this information that was based off of fiscal year 2023 because they referenced the school side based off of April 10th of 2024 so that's what if it is then I have more questions if it isn't then I'm wondering what our status is on some of the things like the written checks to the city from the city have we knocked that down because it says in FY 23 there's 12 million dollars that we wrote to ourselves is that current like around now because this thing's five days away from being a year old was this something that they wrote back after april 10th or is this something that that information was provided from fy23 so you see how i just i can't grasp on when the information is put forth cfo thank you very much uh mr mayor and to the council there are a number of items related to the audit on the agenda this evening the three items under the auditor's business are uh, the financial statements, the schedule of expenditure of federal awards, and the management letter. The examination period of the audit, which is the annual engagement with Powers and Sullivan, is for FY 2023, so 7 1 2022 to 6 30 23. However, under um, the city manager's portion of the agenda, there is an informational report that is a response, um, which has answers to several of the questions, Councillor, that you uh, that you raised, as well as uh, there was a separate audit commissioned by the current superintendent of the school department operations by the Abrams Group. A copy of that audit is included under the uh, city manager's section of the agenda. Um, our recommendation in the informational item is that all of these items be referred uh, either to the City Council's Finance Subcommittee or perhaps a joint meeting uh, of the City Council and School Committee Finance Subcommittees. Uh, there are some concerns raised, some that uh, have been addressed, some that still need to be addressed with the new school administration, and we would recommend we, we speak with the other side at that meeting and get into it in detail. No, I, I maybe you misunderstood what I'm asking you. Is, is on the front page of this management letter that they gave you, if they updated in April, then the management letter should have been updated on the cover saying, okay, this is when we updated the letter because it looks like it's from June of 2023 when in actuality they pulled information from, it just should have had an up-to-date date on when information was changed within it. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the um, auditor, I think. Amara? I can answer that. Um, so the report, the reports are dated Right. Um, May 13th, 2024, that's when they completed their field work. So when, um, when the Abrams report was issued, they had to, it's considered a subsequent event, so they had to incorporate that into their audit. 
But everything's, you know, for the financial period, as Connor mentioned, through June 30, 2023. But the actual date of the reports are May 13, 2024. And they Powers and Sullivan will consider all subsequent events up until that date. So that's what I wish was on the front of this, just the management letter, because the management letter is basically telling you, okay, this is over. This is a date that everything got put together. I'm just wondering how long does it actually take them to do an audit like this? Does it take, all, like, I wouldn't have known that until you just said that it was May, you know, because it's not really highlight. Your management letter should be the end. Okay, on May 13th, this is the final date of this report. That That's really what I was looking for, because the information in there is very, very compu confusing. And as um, Mr. Baldwin stated, yes, it's in other areas of the tonight's agenda, but this is what they gave you. So that's what I was just trying to say is, is there a way to speed this up so that we have it in real time before the budget comes out? And that's what I was like, okay, did they hold this and then give it to us after the budget? Because if you read this, that's what it looks like, the cover page. And then when you get into it, you start seeing the dates are different. And then you say, okay, yeah. So that's all I'm asking is could they put the real date on the front of the management letter so that you know how long it takes them to actually do this report? Because you can see how the confusion can be set in this whole management letter. It's basically okay, here's the end, here's what we finished, here's this, because it is information within here that is 10 months old. So is there a way to get this before the uh, budget? I mean, typically, typically we, in prior years, we've had the reports issued by March. This year was different because um, Powers and Sullivan actually was um, purchased by another firm, so there was a delay due to that. Um, but typically we would have had them around March. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to the CFO, um, I just have a question. Uh, are these uh, reports that we have in front of us, the low FY23 financial statement, the SEFA, and the uh, management letter, are they also provided to the school department or the school committee, the similar to what we have here as well? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, Councillor, we work hand in glove with the school department on the engagement, and they are provided copies of all of the reports when they're released. Um, they had the copy of the Abrams report as well, um, but w yes is the answer to your question. Okay. Um, the follow-up question, uh, I've read the management uh, letter uh, under the school department. I know the council have dealt with the bad bill. I know um, Ms. Uh, Kelly Oak also talked about the past regarding some paychecks and things like that. Uh, under number two, the significant amount of grant funding was returned to federal state awarding agencies in fiscal year 2023. And this is concerning me because we receive the funding from the state and federal and due to the mismanagement or lack thereof, um, the management uh, financial uh, capacity of the city or not doing a good job, the funding return, this is not a good, this is not a good sign and I'm hoping that my colleagues on the school department side you know, we'll take a look at that and try to rectify it. I understand the school superintendent is hiring a new, uh, uh, what we call it, like CFO uh, to to run, and hopefully between the school C new CFO and and the city side work together uh, to rec rectify and correct these uh, these. Uh, this situation and this is not the first year in the letter it stated that it's been for what a number of years that uh, powers and solvent had brought up the critical in the school uh, the school department uh, of the significant deficiency and on the school operation so I'm just hoping that with this report uh, our colleagues on the school side will take a look and then try to correct that so we do not have to deal with you know returning money. It's hard to find grants, and we have grants, and then it got returned. This is not good. Thank you so much, um, CFO and Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Janess. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to make the motion to refer these items to a joint subcommittee um, of the joint financial subcommittee of the city council and the school committee. And I'd also like to ask that one of the things we discuss at that meeting is whether it's time to move on from this third party. Um, the reason I ask that is the delay uh, in light of them being acquired. I know many times when firms like this are acquired, the service level provided to clients can, can degrade or change. If we're already getting the report three months late and they're being acquired, they might be time to see what our options are. Second that. Okay, so under 8.2, there's three information reports. FY 2023 audit management letter, Lowell Public School Director Audit Report, Abrams Group, Standard & Poor's Credit Report. All those three refer to a joint Finance subcommittee on the city and the school side, council as well as well as the items in four one, yes. And four one, all those will take uh, second by council get you. Uh, the motion to adopt and move on was uh, already made. All those in favor say aye. Opposed. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, heading back to the city council motions. Seven point one, Council Mercia request city manager have proper department repair, correct, repaint crosswalks, and make safe the entrance to Fort Hill Park across the Rogers Hall as incidents have been reported. Seconded by Council Leahy, Council Mercia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On June 15th, there was a flea market and outdoor sale at Fort Hill Park. Several people from across the street at Rogers Hall who use walkers and some had canes were there. The entrance to the park was very dangerous to the elderly and others who use this park daily, faced with broken concrete and a crosswalk in need of repainting. Three times these problems were reported, but nothing has been addressed as of yet. I hope I don't see a claim against the city because someone was severely injured because of poor maintenance, so I hope that we don't see that. It is my understanding that people who were concerned about this situation at Fort Hill Park showed pictures of the problems. So I just would like to refer this to the city manager and hope that they get addressed. Thank you so much. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, motion passes 7.2. Council Mercia, Council Young, request city manager invite the Lowell Community Health Center to address the city council and the public about their future plans to open a family medicine residency program to train doctors as well as inform the public of overall services provided by the LCHC. No second needed. Council Mercia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A couple of weeks ago, Council Yem and I were invited to the Lowell Community Health Center at 161 Jackson Street, as I'm sure all of my colleagues were invited as well. We went to learn of a new program called the Family Medicine Residency Program. This is a sustainable solution of training doctors in Lowell, Fall Lowell. It's a program that is a hands-on experience of newly graduated physicians who will bring their medical training to life in a more specialized setting, considering the full impact on social determinants of health, such as poverty and racism, health, justice, cultural proficiency, and community engagement. While uh, Council Yem and I were there, we learned so much of what goes on in that health center, such as dental care services, eye care center, HIV and AIDS services, mental health, med meta health, nutrition counseling, and a pharmacy center. I didn't even know they had a pharmacy there, and they do. So I was very, very impressed with what I saw, as Councilor Yem will tell you as well. So we would like to ask the mayor and the city manager to invite Chief Executive Officer Susan West Levine and Chief Advancement and External Relations Officer Jennifer Meehan to attend a future city council meeting to address this new proposed plan of a family medicine residency program as well as their overall services. The public will find it very, very important as Council E.M. and I did. And if I left something out, Council E.M., thank you. Council E.M. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councilor Mercier. You said everything just like we were at the meeting, so you <laughs> didn't miss anything. But uh, again, uh, we were so impressed, and um, Councilor Mercier and I invite both of them to come 
to, to address the council and to make presentation of what uh, going on over there so that also the people at home who are watching the meeting will learn about all these services that they are providing to the, the city. And I really appreciate their hard work and we want to support their, their, their works. Thank you. Pastor Noon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think um, Councillor, I was with Councillor uh, Dakota. Um, uh, I think everyone was invited uh, by the uh, Sue Levine, uh, the executive, the CEO for the um, local community health. Um, what impressed Councillor Dakota and I most was that we didn't know that they serve a thousand people daily more than a thousand daily and they also provide we didn't know that they not only provide those the health cares and all that and at, at the clinic at the, uh, the community health center they extend that to the high school the clinic uh, the health service at a clinic at low high school and it's the closer right those schools uh, are being providing daily uh, so it's, it's, it's incumbent on when when they're talking about a program that we're talking about that's a forward thinking because we are short of health care i mean the the physician so they train them in-house they work with uh, the top university to do this which needed which needed in the, health, the local community health and surrounding um, uh, uh, health health provider in the in not just in the city of low but outside low as well so i think you know, having them come and, and give us an, an update of their plan and what they do now is certainly um, it's, 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 it's important because they are, they are our partner. So thank you. Councilor Janess. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I too was in attendance with uh, Councilor Noon and Councilor Dakota um, and Councilor Leahy. Um, it was, a, uh, it was a great presentation. It's really exciting to see uh, what the health center is doing uh, for our community, um, what they do now and what they're growing to, to serve us even more. Um, so I look forward to having them come in. I think, uh, I think there's a lot that, um, that they're adding to the community by, by this work, and this is a very exciting program. So I look forward to uh, hearing from them again. Councilor Robinson. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think this is going to be a great presentation. Something that I think uh, our residents and the administration and all of us should be proud of is that um, this program will allow, I believe it's 18 total people in residency, um, various stages over three years. So it's six each year, various stages of a residency, uh, pretty much creating physicians, a pipeline of physicians in the Merrimack Valley. And uh, what's, I think it's only the second one in the state, I believe, but what's so unique to it and, and what the draw from our community is, is how diverse our community is. They'll be able to bring young physicians in to do residency in a, a community where there's all kinds of patients. And so that's something that you don't find everywhere. And, and, and that's a valuable skill that Hopefully these physicians end up sticking around, but if they end up deciding to leave, they'll always know that they've been trained by the community law. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, motion passes. 7.3, Council Mercier. Request the manager have proper department address the six street light issues as presented with this motion in an effort to provide safety to this neighborhood and to prevent incidents of vandalism. Seconded by Council Leahy, Council Mercier. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Some time ago, a neighborhood meeting was held at the CMAA, uh, that's the Cambodian Mutual Assistance Association, at their building on School Street to meet and discuss concerns that residents in the immediate area had. The number one concern was crime and the lack of lighting that could ward off vandalism, theft, breaking into buildings and cars and stealing cars. I am submitting a list uh, to you, Mr. Manager, and to the Law Department. I am submitting a list compiled by Captain Dan Damaris, who presided over the meeting. And, and, uh, and this is, thank you. And, and the six telephone poles that need to be addressed. I didn't put them on the motion, that would have been too long. That would have taken up a page as it is. That, that, that's a list of the six poles that needs to be addressed in the couple square area of the Highlands. 
three poles of which need lights on them, and three poles of which have lights already, but they need to be fixed because the lights are not working or they're broken. So if we could just see that list and try to work with the police department to illuminate, and the Lord said, let there be light, and we will not have any more crime. <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Uh, Opposed, motion passes. 7.4 uh, taken care of. 7.5, Councilor Robinson requests the city manager begin discussions with the Lowell Fire, Fire Department on looking to acquire a ladder truck able to respond to buildings taller than eight stories high, currently weighing in River Place. Seconded by Councilor Gitcher, Councilor Robinson. Motion speaks for itself. Uh, uh, is is this 7.5 the one about uh, ladders for taller stories? It is. Okay. Uh, is the fire chief here? Because I talked to him when they have a brand new fire f truck out there outside before we came into the meeting. We all took a look at it, and it goes pretty darn high. I don't think it goes to the eighth floor. But as I was talking to him, I said, there's a motion on the agenda for this evening by Councilor Robinson. Do you think that um, we could get a fire truck with a higher ladder that would reach taller buildings? And he said, we don't go up a ladder to fight taller fires in taller buildings. We go inside the building. So I, he would have told you that, but I guess we don't need him. Right now. But, but, okay, but that's the gist of what he said, and I thought it was interesting because. All in favor say aye. Mr. Mayor. Motion passes. Thank you. 7.6, Councilor Robinson, explore, sorry, request city manager explore petitioning our state retirement system to relocate our energy dispa emergency dispatchers into the traffic and fire alarm group similar to other communities. Second by Councilor Gitcher, Councilor Robinson. Thank you. Um, a lot of the state retirement groupings are based on stress levels. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, our dispatchers, that's one group that they're not out having visual clues um, when something goes bad. They're pretty much in a room going through the same situation um, without visualizing it. And, and I personally know quite a few. They, they take that home. You can't just hit the switch, similar to a lot of the other positions out there. So I think this is something um, I'd like to make a motion to refer to maybe the personnel subcommittee to really have a little bit more conversation on um, and, and see if this is something for the administration to consider. So a motion on the floor is to refer to personnel subcommittee, please. Second. Second by Councilor Noon. All those in favor say aye. Opposed motion passes. 7.7, 7. Councilor Robinson requests the manager have city solicitor provide a report on elected officials' requirements to accept employment as well as any cooling off periods required update as of 1 24. Seconded by Councilor Gitchia, Councilor Robinson. Thank you. Um, this motion here, uh, again, I I've heard rumblings that it's a personal thing and, and this isn't personal um this is something that was filed in january of this year um i, I i'd like to show if ltc can show the clip uh, of Thank you. the um, initial motion i bring this up because we just went through a similar situation opposite direction we had um an employee coming on to the council as an elected with with my colleague and there was questions up in the air until we finally worked through the details so I just figured the opposite direction. It makes sense to um, take a look at this and get the information in case we're ever faced with that in, in the near future or down the line. It just makes sense to be prepared in case that ever presented itself. Thank you. So as you can see, that's back in January. We're talking five months ago. I, we've yet to get a response. Th this is information on all 11 of us are treated as public employees, municipal employees. If an opportunity presents itself, that's why I said back in January, it'd be good to get the information ahead of time. So who knows if we need it down the line, near future. Now we find ourselves potentially in a situation that, that the information would be valuable because I personally, and I'm sure many others have, have been reached out to by quite a few asking questions on what, what's going on with this. And I just think 
to get the rules of the game bef so everyone's on the same page it, it just makes things go a lot smoother and easier so this is pretty much a, a request for an update from a, a motion previously filed thank you Council the call is telling me you want to speak on this. I don't know if he's on, online or not. Thank you, Mr. Council Mayor. Uh, I did listen to Council Robinson, but I, I do find the timing of this refiling motion quite uh, coincidental or curious, I guess. Um, if you'll give me a little leeway here, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Robinson has nine motions on the on the agenda today. If all 11 councilors filed nine motions this week, we would have 99 motions. We'd be here till four o'clock in the morning. The manager's office and department heads would spend their entire time responding to motions. I do not want to discourage my colleagues from filing motions of important matters. I take exception, however, to the lack of self-awareness evidence by the sheer volume of motions that have a domino effect on city government. Mr. Mayor, can, can we have a point of order? What is this? A second on a motion. Testimony? This is just... I still have the floor. I still have the floor. I asked, I asked for a point of order. I think I have the floor. Uh, Councilor uh, Deco, just uh, on the 7.7, please. I take further exception to a councilor who still has a serious criminal case pending filing a motion right, about... Point of order. Yeah. Point of order. Are we talking about the motion on the floor? Or are we going to start well, fantasizing last, on time, theories? Please stick to seven point seven. I just did. I just made my last sentence. All right. Thank you. Cuts get you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, a lot of these things when you start trying to go to the ethics commission back even in January. So the only person who can actually get a ruling from the Ethics Commission is the person who's actually looking for the ruling. So it never really becomes a public record so anyone can understand actually what is the ruling? How does this go about? And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with asking a question to the city solicitor. What is the opinion of if someone's looking to do something like myself? What is the opinion? I, I've never got a ruling on why I can't get paid because I really didn't care. I didn't really seek that opinion. So if the public wants to know why, then in the city solicitor, through you to the city solicitor, Solicitor Williams, is, the, is this something that you could give a city opinion on or not? I, I don't know the answer, but like myself, I never really, I did get an opinion from you on why I couldn't get paid, which again is the same as this. I didn't the public got the record from what you said on it. So what is different here? I, I don't really understand what the I issue is. I just have a quick comment too, Council. I, I agree with you that the person that's looking to do anything as an elected official needs to call himself or herself to get the opinion. But my opinion is doesn't matter. What your opinion is doesn't matter. Right. What the solicitor's opinion is doesn't matter. It's up to the person to call and to get in writing. Well, Mr. Mayor, the, the, this council, not me, asked for that opinion and, and it passed by all 11 of this council on my personal behalf but now it's like okay we don't want to understand it's for all our benefits and it's for the public who keeps asking the questions i don't i don't truly care what it says if, if whatever it says whatever the right, 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 i, I don't the, care the, the reason i mean the, the, the governing body or the, the only thing that only opinion that matters it's state ethics doesn't but, matter what else no no i i would i agree 100 percent with you but they did it in my personal case i never asked anybody in here to file anything on behalf of why i was paid or wasn't paid i never asked for the city solicitor to give a ruling on that but it came on my behalf and i'm okay with it i, I don't care what the public sees so i don't understand so every situation i don't all, yeah. yeah but just for a, a counselor to come in personal attack on it that's just council scott the timing is definitely suspect on this. I'm going to agree with Councilor Dakota. I'm definitely voting no on this. We have an independent agency that administers the conflict of interest law. If you want an opinion, you can ask for the opinion. We don't need to come on the floor and bully other members. And I stand behind that. So I'm the definite no. Thank you. Councilor Janess. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I think this comes down to the only opinion that really matters is ethics. I don't really want to put the city or Solicitor Williams in a corner by asking him to report on something that he really can't. So I'm a no on this too. 
Councillor Chow. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, um, I do uh, agree with, with your statement earlier, uh, Mr. Mayor, and some of the councillors that mentioned that before. Um, you know, before any, uh, we are elected officials and um, the public trusts us uh, to make uh, decisions and valid decisions for ourselves, whatever we decide to do personally or professionally. Um, I'm pretty confident and trust that Councillor Leahy, before he, or any, or any um, I apologize, let me, uh, if the clerk could retract my last statement mentioning anybody's name. Um, a councillor's name that matter. I just want to say that any of the councillors, before we make any of our decision, personal or professional, we do check uh, with the appropriate department, and in this case, maybe ethics, uh, commission, or what have you. Um, so I don't think this should be a personal matter that be brought up to the city council. Um, I will vote no on this motion as well. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Uh, my thing is, this is requesting an update on a motion that was filed in January, as the clip just showed. And the funny thing now to me is, a lot of my colleagues are making this a personal thing. In January 23rd of 2024, as the clip just showed, when I presented this motion on the floor to prevent situations similar to what's going on right now, not one of these colleagues objected to that motion at the time, and the motion passed. All of a sudden, because they're liking it to a personal situation, now they're objecting to something that was filed five months ago. But yet, I don't understand where this is coming from, from my colleagues here. If they had a problem with the motion, they would have objected back in January of January 23rd, 2024. Now it's on the floor five months later, and I can't support this. I'm requesting an update. If you look at the motion, this is an, a request for an update to a motion that was filed January 23rd of 2024. So I don't understand how people can't support request for an update on a motion that's had five months with no response. It's, is, is this a game we're really gonna stop playing here? That if, if a friend or, or someone that I don't know what's going on. You're trying to protect all of a sudden. Counsel, you, you're doing the same thing Councilor Dakota did. Just stick to the motion. No, and, and I'm talking about the motion. Right. This is a request for an update from the administration yeah, from we, five we, months ago. Motion, right. Five months ago. Right. That, that's gone unanswered. And all of a sudden, people that didn't object when the motion was filed have a problem with getting an object on the, uh, update on the answer. So I'd like to call for a roll call, please. Absolutely. Madam Clerk, roll call. Councilor Janess? No. Councilor Leahy? No. Councilor Mercia? Yes. yes. Councilor Nunn? No. Councilor Robinson? Yes. Mayor Rock? No. Councilor Scott? No. Councilor Yem? No. Councilor Chow? No. Councilor Dakota? No. Councilor Gitchia? Yes. 7.8, Council Robinson requests City Manager have the City Solicitor provide detailed overview of the state ethics regulations on how they apply to elected officials in the municipal employment process. Second. Second by Council at noon, Council Robinson. Again, uh, this is a, a, another situation where I think information and an overview for us to understand how we're impacted as a result of not only local, but also state requirements and regulations that deal with legal aspects uh, i think uh this is just a request and, and maybe that'll be a problem for some too uh, can i get a roll call on this please can anybody else speak on it first council scott sure. i will speak on it i probably shouldn't but um i will say that i am able to read the conflict of interest laws and the laws on my own so i really don't need a, another explanation of them so i'm a no thank you I just again, I'll just say from the from the chair, it's the same situation as last motion. Uh, you know, the, the solicitor, he, his opinion means nothing in this. In this, you call it ethics for reasons. I've certainly called them before and gotten written opinions. I'm sure other counselors have, and you follow what they say to us. So, any other comments? Roll call. Councilor Janess. No. Council Leahy. No. Council Mercia. Yes. Councilor Nunn. Yes. Councilor Robinson? Yes. Mayor Rourke? No. Councilor Scott? No. Councilor Yim? No. Councilor Chow? No. Councilor Dakota? No. 
Council get you. Yes. 7.9, Council Robinson requests City Manager have the property department explore the installation of a stop sign at the bottom of Christian Street at First Street. Seconded by Second. Councilor Noon, Councilor Robinson. Motion speaks for itself. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, motion passes. 7.10, Councilor Robinson requests City Manager have transportation engineer look at residents' traffic challenge areas for installation of speed bumps. Seconded by Councilor Mercer, Councilor Robinson. Thank you. Um, the ones on Billings, it, a lot of people have been reaching out, requesting. Um, I wasn't aware. I believe there is a way that residents can report that already on the website to have them look at areas for improvements. So maybe in the motion response, if we can kind of just get that information out to the public, because I know it's probably citywide people requesting more information about installation of speed bumps. Thanks. All in favor say aye. Opposed motion passes 711. Councilor Robinson. Request city manager provide an update on the multiple additional trash barrel requests throughout the city. Seconded by Councilor Gitcher, Councilor Robinson. Thank you. Um, this motion isn't about residential trash. It's, it's about more green barrels, public barrels in, in green space, because it seems like uh, in some areas there's far less than there's been, and, and it's leading to more tr uh, trash on the ground. So if that's something we could take a look at, I know there's been quite a few and um, I'd have to say the barrels that refuge low and the, the students over there the art studio um, rolled out for the city came out amazing and so I don't know if that's something we could expand on but there are more barrels uh, needed in a lot of areas of public space thank you Council Janess thank you mr. mayor uh, I'd like to thank my colleague for this motion I'm in full agreement um, and one thing I'd like to ask that we do is if we can have reach out and have a conversation with the National Park. I feel like the National Park removed a lot of barrels during COVID um, and they never came back. Uh, the walk, the path between say the new courthouse and up through the Hamilton Canal uh, area, there's probably six or eight barrels that used to exist and no longer do. Um, and I'm sure that's not the only space, but if we could, uh, you know, figure out how to how to add more and to do so with our partners, whether it's the state park, the national park, I think that's the way to go. Thank you. Councilor Yum, then Councilor Gitche. Councilor Yum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for this motion. Um, I'd like to also add to uh, what Councillor Janess just said, that if the city can reach out to the National Park, um, I have residents reach out to me that the trash barrel at the Shihi Park uh, along the Bull, uh, Bong Pawtucket Street, um, that has been overflown, over, overflow with trash and then the wind blow all over uh, because it's in uh, my district in the acre, so people think that's a part of the city uh, park and then if uh, we could do that and, and try to take care of that. They need a more trash barrel because this summertime a lot of people um, uh, uh, went to the park and with families and all of that. So thank you. How's it get you? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to either Manager Golden or Manager Machado, I know at one point we were sending out barrels to be sandblasted or we were looking at new barrels and painted. We did have an account of the barrels then. Do we know are we at the same service level? Or are we at less or more? Do we have any idea, roughly? Mr. Manager? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, through the council. In some instances, we've increased them. It depends on how they're treated. Like, for instance, over uh, South Common, uh, I think it was mentioned by the council here to try to almost double up uh, some of those barrels over in that area. So we did do that. And so far, it's, it's, uh, it's working. A little bit so these other areas we can try that uh, what we have done in the past is we put them forward and then taken them back uh, it really depends on how they're how it's being treated sometimes the they end up in places they're not supposed to, to me when, when people go out they should take their trash with them because a lot of things that are going to happen is that people from the house across the street are taking full furniture and stuffing them in them that, and you're watching this and that is something we've uh, had actually uh, our superintendent of parks has knocked on doors for that once you start seeing uh, household trash there yeah so I think we have to be very careful about 
where we're going to add these and what are the reasons for it. Like Hadley, Hadley has hardly any use in the baseball field, but you're watching the apartment building bring over their trash and throw stuff in it, and then it's just piled everywhere. And, and so I guess we really have to be very, very careful. We're walking a fine line here of, okay, now, and, and I'm sure you, Assistant City Manager Machado sees this often. Um, so. I would caution where we go. I know it's just asking for a report, and I think we just have to be really strategic about, okay, if there's an event, okay, put out another barrel. Okay, if there's no events, then people should start taking their trash with them, and I think they do in many cases. And I think that that's where the balance really has to come. So I, I, I would caution that we just throw barrels everywhere. Mr. Mayor, that's, I think that's a really, it's a really good idea. You know, when permits are, are requested and granted, do we... Do we do something like that as far as bells go? To some of the larger, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, three to the council. To some of the larger events, we would. But uh, whatever the council has in regards to uh, ideas for this, when we do put them out, we do kind of watch them. Because once again, we have no problem putting out extra barrels, but ensuring that they're not utilized by homeowners. Uh, that's, one of the, that's one of the challenges that we've run into. Uh, and it's, it's pretty evident when it happens. Uh, it happened a couple of times up in Gage Field. Once we took it from, um, I guess, the, what we refer to the west side of the, the basketball court and brought it into the park, that stopped happening. So it's definitely something that if anyone has an idea as to where uh, we want to try to increase barrels, you know, maybe along the river, uh, the river way, uh, by Sheehy Park, not a bad, not a bad thought. But uh, when we do put them out, I do know that they do, um, they pay attention to what kind of trash is going in there. A lot of times, you know, if, if you could monitor. So obviously if some park's now are dormant, then you just would get those trash barrels out of there. Because Calorie Park, I can tell you right now, people are bringing full houses across the street or just driving by and dumping stuff all over the place. And it's because the barrel's there. But thank you. Mr. Mayor, uh, so, so one of the stretches is like, say, for example, along Bridge Street by the business corridor. There's not many barrels there. I mean, and you get a lot of foot traffic from, what, 7-Eleven down to CVS, and, and, and there's minimal public barrels. So, I mean, that's one area that gets very littered. Again, same thing kind of over on the Aiken stretch. So, I mean, again, I think the people that are out in the trash truck would be able to keep an eye on since they start seeing residential trash show up, I mean, they, they have that flexibility to move the barrel or whatever. Thanks. I was in favor of say aye. Opposed, motion passes. 712, Council Robinson requests city manager have the proper department explore creating a pollinator garden on Robinson Hill. Seconded by Councilor Gitche, Council Robinson. Thank you. I, I mean, we've been having challenges cutting that hill. I mean, and so you see, I know in Tingsboro they did it at a couple lots because now it removes that from the weekly or biweekly routine maintenance list. They bring in to plant like butterfly bushes and things like that, and now that's one less parcel that they even have to worry about maintenance on. It's, I mean, in the middle of a densely populated urban area, I think it kind of makes sense to explore. Thank you. All in favor say aye. Put motion passes. 713. Council Robinson requests Mayor create an ad hoc committee focused on working with our administration to review and assess best practice recommendations from two prior Collins Center studies. Second by Council Mercia. Council Robinson. Thank you. Um, I sent both to the clerk and he, only one was attached. There was one from 2012 and 2018. And, and there's some good recommendations, and I think this administration has, without, uh, whether or not you've looked at the Collins reports, you, you guys have already implemented and addressed quite a bit of them. But I think uh, there's still some other areas that there's solid recommendations. So putting a, uh, a team together to really sit down and, and listen to where your administration wants to go based on their Collins Center recommendations would be great. Thanks. So as soon as the um, council gets, go ahead. I'm sorry, Mayor. Mayor Rook, through you to the manager. The Collins report is six years old. Is there a plan to like have someone else come in and do another report? What time frame do these become obsolete where you know you did everything or you did as most that you can that we seek another report to make up for it? Is it like every five years, ten years? I, I don't know the time frame on these. That's well, the manager gets on. Council get you. I know Council Leahy and Council Mercio were on board. You know, a couple of suggestions we've already done. Uh, MSBA applications, you know, we've gotten millions of dollars, you know, for our schools just based on that. Um, 
I think some of the I read staffing increases that we've done as well. Uh, that's just before you know Magic Golden got here. So if you want to take it from no, and I, and, I, and I agree with that. That's why I'm, that's why I'm asking because maybe another study will give you other ideas that we can go grab more money somewhere. That's all. Mr. Mitchell. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, through the council. Councilors, there is a transfer tonight um, to make that happen. Uh, to follow up on, uh, we we put it out in the. If that is indeed, um, if that money is transferred, then we'll be I'll be able to execute the contract and probably share who the contract uh, recipient was. Matrix, uh, Matrix uh, organization that did put it out, and that would be uh, council where we're going with after the 2019 study. Uh, th looking through the 2019 study up until today, I do believe that prior manager my, and then myself, we've been moving in that direction to solve those issues and solve those problems. We have a lot of uh, questions to ask Matrix, which, which is hopefully gonna be the new company if the council would like to move forward later on today after the transfer uh, and asking these some of these questions, uh, but even diving a little bit deeper into other areas of DPW. Would they be? To try to I'm sorry to try to in increase all the different efficiencies uh, throughout DBW. So would they be requesting this Collins report, looking at it, and then developing another one, just to have some back history of the whole thing? Because I think that that's important that we look at the history. Okay, where were we? How do we get here? What are the resources that they're going to write? Because everybody can look at something and write something that you're never going to achieve so that's why if they could this could be included and they'll probably that, ask that question that would be that'd be correct although the 2019 report was really looking at uh lands and buildings we're looking at uh parks and um streets but we would absolutely share it to let them know where we're going and, and what has happened uh and if they do come up with a different caliber a different idea we'll be chasing that down but that'll be uh the decision of this council this evening so so as soon as I get three to five people that are interested in it, I'll put it together. All in favor say aye. Opposed motion passes. Seven, uh, 14. Council Scott requests city manager work with the appropriate department to develop an online census of middle form. Seconded by Council Yem. Council Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, if this is something we could offer residents, I think it would be a good service for them. Um, I did see that the city of Cambridge allows an online census submittal form um, as long as there are no changes to the form. You can do it online. I did speak with Mr. Pappas. He did say that he would have to uh, find out from the Secretary of State's office in Cambridge how they make that happen, how they make that function. Um, but it is something, like I said, if we can look into, I think it would be a good service for residents and would help us get some of the census forms back. Thank you. All in favor say aye. Opposed, motion passes. Moving on, section eight, communications from the city manager, motion response A, ring platform, Councilor Robinson. Thank you, and um, I'd just like to say thank you to the chief and LPD and the administration. Uh, started at a conversation with the neighborhood group, and I'm glad to see that the chief and his team looked back into it and retired back in because it is growing in popularity, and I think it's just another tool that they can throw in their toolbox to blast out relevant information. Thank you. What's your response? Oh, I'm sorry, Council Jess. Just a quick question on, on how this program works um, with, with Ring and sharing uh, videos with the police or anyone else, really. Do you know if it's, if it's something that a um, resident would need to opt into, or is it just part of the regular license agreement with, with Ring? Mr. Manager? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, through to the Council. Uh, typically, what happens is the uh, individual has to share it. Okay. Uh, in a, in a different matter, I know the chief is in the building right now, but in a different matter, uh, if, the, if the PD had to go after it because of something, sure. uh, that's a totally separate thing that yep. they'd have to go after ring. Uh, and okay. not being an attorney, I'm going to leave that one uh, right where it sits. Okay. But uh, typically, uh, Councilor, what we have is we have individuals who are willing to, to, to share their information. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. If I may comment, um, actually the chief reached out about this motion response, and, and this isn't necessarily as much about the sharing of the residents to the LPD, which that's completely voluntary. If they choose to do so, they could do so now via email or whatever, because they're in possession of that video from their camera. This is more so ring office for organizations, uh, specialized account. So like something like, 9, 9 p.m. don't forget to lock your doors because rings grown in such popularity they can select the low area type in whatever message they want as LPD official 
and, and send that blast out to all ring users so you would get alerted and say, oh, 9 p.m., uh, reminder from LPD, lock your doors. You know, it, it's, it's geared more for them to have another av as they do with their uh, Instagram or Facebook or what, whatever way they want to share information out. It could even be something as other, other police departments are using it as if, say, a hit and run, they could send a blast out to users of ring in this specific geographic area and say um lpd's on the lookout for a white vehicle that fled the scene if you have any video footage and you'd be willing to submit it please submit to lpd and and so it is kind of a direct communication to ring users in the community and and, and it is purely voluntary for users to give or send anything back to the lpd What's your response B, P parking placards? Councilor Robinson. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to the administration. Thank you, Terry Ryan. Um, I just think it's, you know, this was something that a lot of, a lot of residents were kind of uneasy about the increase. And, and I'd just like to keep all, everyone monitoring, is this a program that's being utilized? And, and what's the result of this? Thank you. What's your response C? Pickleball, how's it get you? To you, Mr. Mayor, to Assistant City Manager Baez Rose, thank you for putting this together. I, I think that, you know, because of the price, it, it should be something that we can just get three quotes and push it through. So the residents who keep asking me for this pickleball, which I was told, you know, an elderly person can beat me at, so they probably can. <laughs> but um, I guess they really like this game. So thank you again. What's your response, D? Pox Projects, Council Scott, and Yem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think the only comment I have on this is that this says um, DPD anticipates uncovering all APA funds related to these projects by December 31st, 2024 deadline. That they do have to all be encumbered by that point, correct? I mean, there's no leeway or anything in that. So the anticipation is really that we're going to have them all encumbered by that point in time, correct? Okay, thank you. Council Yem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to uh, Ms. Byros. Um, from the management letter under the APA State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund, current year's common, the city has received approximately $76 million for APA. However, only $14.5 million has spent as of June 30th, 2023. So another $51.6 million uh, still need to be committed by the end of 2024. My comments regarding not just the park, but other program that we do have all the commitment to spend this APA money, right? We do not want to have this return similar to what we've seen in the school department uh, management letter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. CFO. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that's an excellent point and concern that the councilor raises. Uh, in the management letter that we referenced earlier and in the response, because the audit um, examination period was 2023, they were looking as, as of 6-30-2023. Um, we do expect as of the end of this fiscal year that we will have encumbered or have in the pipeline, so in some stage of procurement, about $63 million uh, worth of the ARPA grant by the end of the fiscal year, with $11 million of potential projects either in some stage of design or beginning the procurement process. So we are confident now, uh, we, Mr. Machado, myself, uh, we meet with Mr. Flynn and Mr. Ball every week to go, go over the ARPA projects and their status, uh, but we do anticipate encumbering the full balance of the ARPA before the deadline. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm happy to hear. So uh, let's let's move on and let's confirm, spend the money, so we don't need to return it. Thank you so much for your hard work. How's it get you? Thank you, and, and thank you, um, CFO Baldwin, for highlighting that because in that report that we just talked about, again, it says one thing, and it's a whole total different thing because of the time frame of that report and it just makes I think all of us look bad because of the length of time it takes to get these things done and it makes it look like none of this is being done. I do have a question to the manager on um, the Hadley Park lighting. We all knew that the number was a lot higher than that than the $500,000 that is put aside for that. 
Is that something that now is no longer? And why should we even seek something that we know isn't even going to be remotely close to that number? Um, that, that's the question. Why, why do we have this money as a placeholder in this position if we can't even get, you're not going to get anything for that kind of money? We all have had this conversation multiple times. So why hold it as a placeholder? We're still trying to work on getting, at minimum, we know we want to have lights at the park, right? And so I think if we can get a design that we can fund um, and and then fund the construction uh, at a later time, that's something I think that's worth doing. Uh, and since we have the availability of funds, we are pursuing um, trying to at least get the design work underway for the lighting so that if we can identify funds at a future time that are not ARPA and don't have the same kind of deadline, uh, that we might be able to just move forward straight into construction instead of having to start over again. Um, to be fair, I think we also, haven't put out bids for construction and so uh we'll see how much um you know we may have overages in other areas i don't think we'll be sitting on these funds i was hoping that that con this conversation would have been held long before i just read it in this report because we have talked about this and we talked about the overages and the manager said don't worry about the overages we should be able to cover it on hadley park and the lights now we're hearing, okay, we'll get the study done and there's not going to be lights. And, and again, if this $500,000 has to go into the daily school or the daily school to have the heating and stuff, I would rather have it go there. But if this is funding that can be done over here and we can get this done, this is important to get people out of their homes because it Hadley could be used as a soccer field if you had the paint machines that could paint on it. It could be used as a lot of different things because that outfield could be stretched out and and it has parking, it has everything. We have parks in this city that have lights on them that stay on and no one's even at them. Councilor Scott and I were one at one the other day and they had said that the lights are on every night and no one's there. And this park would be heavily used, but if it can't be used, let's just be open and honest with it and say, look, you know what? We gotta abandon this project and let's get it into something else in the Highlands. And I'm sure Councilor Dakota would have some you know, he is their district councilor now who would have some interesting input on where we could use those funds, that's all. And if we need to do that as soon as possible, let's just move on from the project and, and see where we're going. Thank you. Bush response E, Wiggins and Woolley Street, Council Yem. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for a great report, and I appreciate uh, the city uh, willingness to work with the developer to make it a smooth transaction. That will be uh, another housing uh, production for our city who really need it. So I appreciate your, your willingness to work with the developer who will be taking over. The property is under agreement, and it's, I'm told that it's going to close uh, very soon. Thank you again. Bush response F. Smith Dispensary, Council Leahy. Uh, thank you for the report. And uh, I spoke to uh, system manager Machado on this and spoke to the um, traffic engineer. I just wanted her to take another look at it and make sure that this is a plan that will work because the drawing that was presented um, doesn't look like it'll work. So. Um, she assured me she'll look into it before anything's done, but it, it, I mean, it really is. I must get 10 calls a week on this. Um, people are just tired of cars cutting across four lanes of traffic, almost causing accidents. So it has to be a definite right-hand turn, either creating a ramp out or something, but it, the drawing doesn't look like it'll do it, so. If we can uh, make sure it's done correctly before it's done, it would be appreciated. Thank you. See a ramp? A ramp? A ramp, yeah. You know, okay. right out the That's side. That. Okay. Something. What's your response? <laughs> With speed, speed bump. It's okay. Yeah. Paving a VFW um, Mammoth to Mongolia Street. Constantly get you. Thank you, Mayor Rook. Um, through you to Assistant City Manager Shadow. Thank you for the report. Do you know when the last day of the trench disturbance was? That they actually did any work over there? Uh, I, what I heard today was that DeFelice would be starting the milling 715, so I'm assuming it's 90 days before that. So, so I, they're in the ballpark um, of the 90-day period. 
I've said this before, and I'm just going to say it again, is that I think the city should look at the state regulations on how trenches are treated and start applying it here. Because at the end of the day, most of our road problems are from old trenches or around manhole covers. And it's because we're not letting them settle long enough. And the state is telling you right here, they, they have an unbelievable outline on what you have to do. And if people don't like it, they should find another community to go to. That's all. And, and I, I do think it, it would be much, much better on our roads and we wouldn't be where we are. Just go look at some of these roads. It's all from trench work. And I, I do think if we can look at theirs and start trying to incorporate some of their ideas into ours, you're going to save yourself a lot of headaches. Maybe not you, but somebody 30 years from now. Right, moving on to 8.2, official reports. Lowell Fire Department. Mr. Manager. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to the council. Council, this is an opportunity, uh, and I know that the chief is in the building, and actually, here he comes. <laughs> Thank you much, uh, Chief. If you'd like to uh, just speak about the 8.2 for the Lowell Fire Department and everything that's been going on, I'd appreciate it. Certainly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, the council. Um, in the report provided uh, that we have a lot of very, very positive steps. Uh, the fire department, as of late, is in a renaissance period. Uh, it, it's due to the goodwill of the council, uh, the administration, uh, seeing the needs that have been there for several decades now. Uh, the money that's been provided to keep the fire stations open 24-7. Uh, the ARPA funding that was brought forward to us, uh, the free cash funding that was brought forward to us for vehicles, uh, identifying uh, the big problems that we originally in, had in relation to the fleet, both in support vehicles and response vehicles. Uh, so what we tried to do in this report is just to give you a general idea of where the department is going, and I'll just go over some very quick points. Um, first and foremost, um, our, our responses so far this year in the first six months, we're at about 6,900 calls. Uh, we generally get close to 14. There have been a few years since where we've had almost 16,000 over the course of the year, which is typical for us. Um, we are very much focused on getting our OPM on board so that we can begin to evaluate the firehouses and determine the projects that we believe are gonna be a priority for us going forward which includes identifying major projects for firehouses and also identifying uh, where we might be throwing good money after bad with infrastructure. Uh, we also have obviously made some big improvements in the fleet. Uh, for those of you who are able to attend early, uh, we appreciate your support. You got an opportunity to see the first ARPA vehicle, which has recently arrived, our brand new Ladder 4, which is a 100-foot aerial ladder, and it's going to be uh, placed in service within a week or two after its upfitting is completed over at the West 6th Street Firehouse. Uh, we're looking forward to the arrival of uh, another five engines right at the end of the calendar year. And that's going to be crucial because our uh, situation with some of the older vehicles is, is getting pretty critical. The fire department's um, day staff divisions have also been very busy. Uh, we have had... Um, over 900 building-related inspections uh, through our Fire Prevention Bureau. Multiple fire investigations were conducted by the Fire Investigation Unit. Uh, we've reached out to over 6,000 uh, people in the community, specifically school children at the third and fifth grade level. Um, within 10 of the schools at the beginning of the year, many of them were also reached um, at the, the previous six-month period. As far as specialty services are concerned, um, We've increased the sizes of the field communications unit team and the dive team. Uh, safety and training, we've done a, a, and are in the process of doing internal trainings that allow us to create a, a fire ground that is much safer. These are some internal restructurings, which include <laughs> standard operating procedures and different types of procedures that we would do on a fire ground that allow us to incorporate safety into it. As you know, the fire ground is very dangerous. Firefighters get cut, injured, they fall. And we need to have the right procedures in there so that we can ensure their safety in a very volatile environment. So the training on that continues. 
As far as the future is concerned, uh, at the very end of the report, we wanted to identify the vehicles that were getting replaced. Uh, there's quite a few of them there that we plan on and that will be coming in in the near future due to ARPA funding from the most recent budgeting for FY25. We also uh, have identified grant funding that is being used from various sources, including EMPG, the Firefighter Safety Grant, and so forth that allow us are going to allow us to upgrade our smaller rescue boats, uh, incorporate handheld sonar, which can be utilized by both the dive team and the rescue teams whenever we're doing water rescues, um, and also help us move forward on several pieces of equipment uh, that will allow us to provide better service to the community. Open to any questions Thank you, that the Chief. Council has. Council Yum. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chief. Um, congratulations on the brand new trucks. And I was uh, with Councillor Mercier, was able to um, to touch the trucks and, and take some pictures with the trucks as well. There's a lady who's sitting there and she pulled me aside and she said, well, it's a beautiful truck, but it's not electric. I said, that's school coming. <laughs> <laughs> but again, uh, my quick question to you, sir, is that do we, are we on personnel side? Remember the last, when you appear, you talked about there's some difficulties in recruiting new recruits, and then you were behind, and some of the uh, firehouse maybe brown out closed because of the personality, personnel uh, shortage. Can you comment on that? Are we Abs Absolutely, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the council, uh, councilor. Um, we have begun the process of hiring the last seven individuals to get ourselves to the 213 limit, a place where we have not been since 2015. Uh, once we finalize that and we get them into the academy, we expect to have them on trucks by November and the department will be fully manned. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the chief. Um, so the full complement of firefighters is 213. 213. Um, and it says here that there are eight um, manned stations. That is correct. But there are two auxiliary locations. What is an auxiliary location and where are they? So that's where the day staff divisions will work, the guys that work generally on days. So uh, the old engine nine, up in the Oaklands across from Shed Park is currently our training center. Oh, oh, I so see. So the training captain, the EMS uh, coordinator for the city, and uh, the community education officer work at that facility. And then the Fire Prevention Bureau, which includes all of our inspectors and the hazardous materials officer, they operate out of um, the school up on Pine Street. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. How's it get you? Thank you, Mayor Rourke. I just want to say thank you to the manager and his staff for the hard work they've done over the period of time to get these trucks up and running, funded, starting to get into the fire stations and starting to actually upgrade them. That hasn't been done in 40 years. And I want to thank you, Chief, because I know how we went through all of these issues and you worked hard at trying to get this stuff together in, in your staff for even going through this stuff with breakdowns of trucks and trying to manage through the city. I think we're gonna be in a much, much better place so that we can actually invest in other areas. And um, I just wanna thank you, your staff, for their patience going through this process. And um, I think it's important that we continue to write capital plans for every department, not only yours, but we have to project future cost. And, and if we do that, then we'd never end up in this place again. And, and I just wanna thank your staff for their patience and their hard work through extremely challenging times. And, and thank you again. Thank Scott. You. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just had one question um, in here. It says the funding has been secured within the FY25 budget to begin apparatus floor repairs at two firehouses, Lawrence Street and Gorham Street. I'm just curious um, how that timeline relates to the new equipment purchases that are coming in. Uh, so the replacement for ladder one, which is going to be at the Lawrence Street firehouse is expected to appear sometime between April and May of next year. So we anticipate we hope that we will be able to complete that project, which will structurally reinforce ladder one side of the Lawrence Street Firehouse uh, so that the apparatus um, will um, not exceed the weight limit of the apparatus floor. Thank you. Cousin Lee. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chief. And I wanted to thank um, the manager and his team and your department for everything that you've been doing. Um, 
appreciate the effort that's been put in over the last few years with turnout gear and the new trucks, Mr. Manager. Um, the only thing I would like to really focus on now, I know we're doing a lot of work. Um, if there's any way we can come up with any energy savings or anything that would help us replace windows, you know, and if we could do, uh, you know, an ambitious goal of two firehouses per year over the next eight years, uh, maybe we could work out some sort of a deal where we could purchase all the windows over a four-year period, but um, anything we could do with our energy department to find money, grants, things like that. Um, and we're really on a roll here. The last couple of administrations and uh, with your efforts, Chief, and the previous Chief, uh, we're really making some headway here and appreciate all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Anyone else? Chief, thank you very much. Thank you. Information report, banners. Mr. Manager. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to the council. Uh, Mr. Crew, if you could uh, update us on banners, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, I will direct folks to uh, the screens or your screens on your table. Uh, so this spring case working with uh, Melissa and the manager's office started looking at uh, a real replacement of our, of our existing Lake Lowell banner system. Uh, we know it's been a long time coming, and we knew we had an opportunity this year with the resources that we had to do that. So really in February, we started looking at uh, what the feasibility of doing a complete banner replacement for our existing banner inventory would look like. Um, and we knew from some research that we'd done sort of over the previous year, sort of where we were gonna be roughly uh, cost-wise. So we knew for uh, the scale of this, we were gonna need to explore options through several different vendors in terms of looking at that. Uh, and we started that process in March of reading out, reaching out to some local companies uh, who we knew could do that. Um, in April, we found a quote that, that worked for what we wanted to do in a company that we thought could really do the work, uh, Express Signs and Banners out of Chelmsford. They've worked for the city before and also worked for UML. Uh, they're also a women-owned business. Uh, and the big thing with this project is they do design and install. Uh, we, wanted, we really wanted to experiment with this project of uh, engaging with a uh, company who could do both sides of the process. And we also completed the survey of sort of the existing banners in April as well. Um, in May, new banner printing started uh, with the company. Um, their estimated time frame to complete that was two weeks, and they were, they were great at sticking with that. Um, and by June, as you'll see now, all the banner install was completed, and it took about four weeks for the company to do that install. Uh, we decided for this project that we would focus on sort of the existing banner footprint for what that is. Uh, the streets laid down here, uh, really covering a wide swath of downtown and some of the major corridors into the city uh, were the focus of this project. These also happen to be the areas where there's existing banner infrastructure, uh, which accelerates the timeline with that as well in terms of what we can do. Um, for this project, uh, again, looking at things to really move this along faster, we decided to stick with the existing banner designs. Uh, this is just an example of what those look like and what some of the new banners currently out on the polls look like. Uh, we were very happy with how they, uh, how they came out uh, and how they're looking up on the polls right now. And then uh, by the numbers, we had a total of 104 banners that were replaced this spring. Uh, the total budget cost for this was a little over $20,000, uh, with a, about a little over half of that going to printing, uh, and then the rest to the installation period. Uh, and Express Signs and Banners was able to complete the installation uh, in a four-week period, which was really great. Um, and the ex estimated life expectancy on these new banners is three to five years. Uh, so we expect them to remain in decent shape for, for quite a while to come uh, as we look at sort of what the future of the banners in Lowell is going to look like. Uh, and I would be happy to take questions from anybody. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first, thank you to Mr. Crew and your staff for, for doing this. It does make a difference in, in the appearance of the of the neighborhood. So I, I appreciate having new ones out there. Uh, my only real question is, is did we get any spare banners, um, or are they all out? 
Thank you, Ms. Mary. Through you to Councillor Jeness. We already had a few in stock. Uh, in, cons in consultating with the company, we decided at this point to just have them do a complete restock. So we have a few already uh, that, that are holdover. So if things happen, we're in a position to replace those. Perfect. Thank you again. Screw, thank you very much. Good job. Official report bicentennial funding. Mr. Manja. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to the council. Uh, Mr. Crew, if you'd like to speak about the bicentennial funding or what has been happening with the bicentennial. Sure. So planning for the bicentennial is continuing. We actually had a meeting with uh, Tomo 360 today, uh, finishing up work on the website. Um, and I hope maybe within next week or two, uh, we'll share that with you before that website goes live. Uh, it looks really, really fantastic. Tomo did a really, really great job. Uh, and we're continuing now just in the planning and budgeting stages of that event, uh, working with uh, the CFO and the manager's team on continuing to make sure we're really setting the city up for a really fantastic bicentennial year. Any questions? Council Young? Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Uh, I just want to um, to say thank you for putting this together. The the um, bicentennial is very um, it's important for the city. Um, and you mentioned that you will give us an update in the next two or three weeks. I uh, expect within the next two or three weeks that the website will be live. And okay. before we do that, we'll we'll right. that. the website's got a lot yeah. of terrific information. Okay. And then anything else that uh, as a council, council, we can do to support the effort of celebrating this bicentennial. So Absolutely. please, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much. Good job. Information report, EPA grants for some manager. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, through to the council. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank um, Assistant City Manager Rose and her staff for doing this such, such a fine job in this two grants that we have. The first one being for a half a, half a million dollars uh, to concentrate down in the jam plan area. And the second one is a $5 million, uh, $5, five million dollar authorization, which you'll be asked to vote on. And that's to clean up in and around the uh, Beaver Street Bridge or in front of the old Tonys or the new Top Donut, whichever way you'd like to remember that. Uh, that, that area, unfortunately, uh, was something that was built up over the years. And um, according to the assistant city manager, which I'd like to kick it over to uh, Ms. Rose in a moment, it's probably going to cost about $5 million to finish up that uh, that clean up in that area. Uh, and, and our hope, obviously, in the future is to create that walkway uh, along the uh, the Willette Bridge, once again in front of uh, Tony's, all the way down to the Cox Bridge, which is on Bridge Street. So, uh, Ms. Rose. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is uh, an application. The, the Brownfields cleanup grants are applications that the city has aggressively pursued for many years, and we have successfully applied for it in the past. This is by far the largest award we've ever gotten in a, at a, in a single grant. So um, I'm really excited. Uh, Sarah Brown, our chief design planner, was this, the, the primary writer of this grant, and she did a great job. Um, as the manager said, we got half a million dollars to do um, assessment work, which essentially help, will help us identify any sort of cleanup needs. Uh, and those funds are per specifically for use on city-owned properties. Uh, as a part of the grant, you have to identify a location in which you want to focus those, but we're not beholden to that. Um, and so if something were to come up that there was another site that we had potential development on that was city-owned and we wanted to do some assessment work, we'd be able to move forward on that. Um, and then the, the big $5 million is for uh, the area along the river. Um, there is contamination there, we know, and have already spent funding uh, to clean up that work. Um, as we were discussing the idea of pursuing this grant for this request, uh, ultimately the conversation in DPD was, you know, we cannot spend $5 million and end up with clean grass. Um, and so the idea is that we're going to invest the funds to do the cleanup work and simultaneously start trying to fund um, a significant design project to sort of activate that, that riverfront space to essentially create what we hope will be a really um, new and exciting and sustainable waterfront park in the city. Um, 
we have a lot of really exciting activity happening in the area with the work that's going on in St. Louis Park as well, which also has a focus on sustainability and resilience. And so we're excited to sort of bring that same uh, motto, I guess, across the street um, to, to the Riverside as well. So the plan is to use these funds for the actual cleanup work. And then the team is already uh, putting together proposals for design work. Um, we anticipate using a portion of CD BG funds to help do that design work, and then we'll very aggressively pursue grants to actually pay for the construction. Awesome. Thank you very much. I know we have two votes upcoming on this. Um, um, Madam, uh, quick, quick question, Mr. Yes, one second. Yeah, one second. Uh, Mr. Yem, Council Yem, just want to pass along. Uh, I know that Ms. Brown uh, worked very hard on applying for these grants. Uh, did the legwork to uh, to get them and to have them accepted by the city of Lowell. We had a ceremony a couple weeks ago with the five point uh, five Applying. five million five hundred thousand dollars, and uh, it was through the hard work of uh, her and the DPD team that not only applied but it was granted these uh, awards. So please pass along our thanks to the council. Thank you very much, Council Young. Um, just um, I think you touched on uh, already the five point five million dollars that uh, Congresswoman Lord Johan. Uh, presented at the city hall is this the one that we talking about right the same one. yes sir yep. yeah. thank you thank you again for uh, the a great job the city have done applying for this funding thank you uh, we need a motion to uh, accept all communications from the city manager uh, motion to adopt by council merchant second by council young place on file all the fearless ai opposed motion passes uh, motion by council merchant to bundle 9.1 through 9.9 uh, 920 yeah. Second by, second by Councillor Chow. So I'll, I'll go through them and then we can just take <laughs> really as, a, as a question and accuse themselves. That's totally fine. Right, so right. all in favor say aye. Opposed, motion passes. Here we go. Um, votes for the same engine 9.1. Vote to apply, accept, expend 5 million EPA Brownfields cleanup fund grants. 9.2. Vote, accept, apply, expend 500,000 EPA Brownfields assessment grant. 9.3. Vote to approve ORR permit for warp and weft. 9.4. Vote to approve the FY25 Community Preservation, Community Preservation Fund budget. 9.5, vote to authorize the city manager request approval to change acre, urban revitalization and development plan. 9.6, vote COLA increases for ordinance employees. 9.7, ratify and approve the execution of the city manager of amended MOU with low organization of city engineers. 9.8, ratify and approve the execution of by the city manager of amended MOU with Traffic Supervisors Association, 9.9. .9. Vote to ratify and approve the execution of the city manager of MOU with ASPE Local 1705A. 9.10, vote to ratify and approve the execution by the city manager of MOU with ASPE Local 2532. 9.11, vote ratify and approve the execution of city manager of MOU with Firefighters Local 853. 9.12, vote to ratify and approve the execution by city manager of MOU with the Lowell Police Association, Inc. 9.13, vote to ratify and approve the execution by city manager of MOU with Lowell Police Superior Officers Association. 9.14, vote to ratify and approve the execution by city manager of MOU with MVEA Inspectors Union. 9.15, vote to ratify and approve the execution by city manager of MOU with MVEA Unit C. 916, vote to ratify and approve the execution by the city manager of MOU with MVEA Unit D. 917, vote to ratify and approve the execution of the city manager of MOU with SEIU Local 888. 918, vote to set FY 2025 revolving funding spending limits. 919, vote to transfer $124,259 for professional services. And 920, vote to transfer $20,000 to Disability Commission Revolving Fund. Nice job, Mr. Mayor. It took you less than three minutes to get through all this. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, motion to uh, to approve by Council Yam, second by Council Mercer. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to ask if I may have request a 9.5 to be referred to the Housing Subcommittee. It has to do with the Acre Urban Revitalization and Development Plan. This plan was uh, approved by the Council back in 1999, and all the councilors who are here today, most of them are not are not here uh, at the time, so we also need to look at the plan. We have not, I know, a large document, so we would like to have a chance to look at that at the housing subcommittee if that's uh, the body, the willing of the body. Thank you. Ms. Baez Rose, is there anything we can do tonight to quell those questions? It can go to a subcommittee, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right, so motion to take 9.5 out 
to send to the Housing Subcommittee by Councilor Yem, seconded by Councilor Janess. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, it passes. Councilor Gitche. I just have a question on 9.8, the um, Traffic Supervisors Association contract. What I don't understand is under the bereavement piece. I, I read every single contract. And it says, on only this one does it say, upon completion of one year of employment, employees shall be eligible to receive three days for bereavement pay. That's ridiculous. Someone's family member passes away, and just because you're not here within the first year, we don't give bereavement pay? No other contract has this, none. And all the other ones have more time than this off. It, it just, if you hire someone and someone passes away, Within the first year, why would it matter? I've read every single one of these MOUs tonight, and, and this is the only one that has this piece in there. If you can go back and just straighten this piece out. Mr. Manager? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, through the council. Uh, Councilor, that's what they asked for. I, I, I would just suggest to you that we would go back and really relook at this piece. We can move forward, vote on it, and I could, we could uh, enter into a side agreement, side letter agreement, but they were actually very happy. I, I, I get that I don't, no other contract in here has this piece in there. And some of them in here, one of them has a five day pay for bereavement leave where others only have three. So. This piece is just disturbing to me to even think that someone sat back and said okay to it when you're hiring somebody and it could be a wife, a husband, it could be a lot of things that pass away in the first year, that's all. And, and I, I would I'd take you at your word, Mr. Manager, that you'll go back and, and look at it. Yeah, I get it. Um, Anything else? In, yes, uh, 9.6, if I can recuse myself from 9.6, Mr. Manager. get you recuse himself from 9.6. So now we have 19 votes. Uh, motion has been made to, uh, to adopt uh, and seconded. Madam Clerk, roll call. Councilor Janess? Yes. Councilor Leahy? Yes. Councilor Mercia? Yes. Councilor Nunn? Yes. Councilor Robinson? Yes. Mayor Rourke? Yes. Councilor Scott? Yes. Councilor Yim? Yes. Councilor Cho? Yes. Councilor Dakota? Yes. Councilor Gitche? Yes. 10 report subcommittee 11 1 ad hoc superior court house restoration may 21st 2024 council robinson i'll have that ready next uh meeting that that was supposed to be ongoing another one coming so we we're going to wrap it up i was just waiting on some information thanks All right, so madam clerk we'll wait until the completion of that meeting before we put it on for a, a um, an update makes sense so it just continued last was it, was it ended okay great uh, to order the clerk oversight personnel subcommittee may 30th 2024 council uh, scott thank you mr mayor the auditor clerk and personnel subcommittee meeting um, met on may 30th 2024 at 6 p.m um, in attendance were council Leahy, council yam and me also present were connor baldwin cfo and neil osborne hr director the purpose of the meeting was to discuss shared goal setting and an approved evaluation tool uh, Mr. Baldwin provided a presentation outlining the Plan E form of government, noting a slight variance which put the day-to-day -day operations of the auditor and clerk under the manager and regular oversight to the council. Um, he noted that the manager had a contract until 2027 and that the three-year appointments for clerk and auditor would need to be extended before the end of this year. Uh, Mr. Baldwin noted evaluations were done late fall before any salary increase was done. He also commented on resources available to construct an evaluation tool. Uh, discussion continued among the committee members, including um, around having more performance-based metrics, shared goals, and a more robust evaluation procedure than we presently have. Uh, Mr. Osborne noted that there must be a mutual understanding by the body to develop an effect effective evaluation tool. Um, Councilor Yem indicated the use of a consultant could be utilized and helpful in this process. Um, a motion was made by Councilor Yem, seconded by me, to have city manager um, have the city manager have the CFO and HR director investigate the process of hiring a consultant regarding developing an effective evaluation tool for employees under the supervision of the council. 
The motion was approved unanimously by the committee, and I would just submit that as a report of progress at this time. Thank you, Council Scott. Three transportation subcommittee, June 25th, 2024. Subbed for uh, Council Dakota, Council Jeunesse. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, happy to pinch hit for Council Dakota here. Um, so we met earlier. The uh, president roll call was uh, myself, Councillor Noon, and Councillor Dakota was present on Zoom. Also joining us in the room were Councillor Gitcher and Councillor Mercier. Uh, we were joined by George Anastas, who's the Lowell Regional Transit Authority General Manager, and David Bradley, who's the Lowell Re Regional Transit Authority Administrator. Um, the first thing we talked about was the additional funding that uh, LRTA uh, received as part of this year's state budget. They received $4.6 million in increased funding from the Fair Share Amendment. The priorities for that funding as set by the governor were to address staffing and increase service on evening, weekends, and during the daytime. Um, and so the first priority uh, for, for the LRTA was to build up the infrastructure starting with staffing. Uh, as a point of note, on November 30th, LRTA had 48 drivers for their fixed route system uh, as a result of the COVID pandemic and just general state of the economy. They were previously at 60 drivers. So the first thing they needed to do was to rebuild that staff. So the first step was to negotiate union contracts with the ATU and the Teamsters for their fixed routes and paratransit coverage. Uh, doing that and uh, aggressively recruiting, they are now up to 63 drivers as of today, which has allowed them to go back and add service that, that has been missing since the, really the beginning of the pandemic. There's still, some of these drivers are still under, um, under training. It takes about four to four and a half months to train a driver from being hired to being fully onboarded and out in revenue service. Yesterday, they, they were able to begin expanded service with 30-minute intervals on three routes down from 60 minutes and run three additional routes on Saturdays. They were able to break six routes that they had been forced to combine during the pandemic back into six individual routes. Um, this has resulted in up to six buses an hour through the downtown sector. Uh, going back to Gallagher Terminal and vice versa, thanks to breaking up all these routes. The next step is, a step is to add additional nighttime service and also they're looking at adding some selected Sunday service. We had some good speakers who came from the community to express their concerns and really begin a good conversation with, with the LRTA around service improvement, uh, increased funding, uh, what the roadmap is for electri electrification of the bus fleet, uh, funding for low slash no emission vehicles and training. Um, the LRTA was awarded $7 million from the federal government for capital funding to go to specifically to go towards electrification of the fleet. Right now the organization is focusing on replacing older diesel buses with diesel hybrid buses. Um, they are still looking at electric buses, hybrid buses, and CNG buses. Some of the concerns around that are these buses weigh more, so there's a, there's a weight concern on some of the bridges around the city. They are also taller, so there's also a bridge concern from passing underneath bridges. These, all these buses are approximately a foot taller than the existing, um, bridge, existing buses, so getting them under some of the bridges will prove to be difficult. So there's some questions about how to maintain service in some of our neighborhoods where you're reliant on some of those bridge passings. So that's something that they're still working on and, and still trying to uh, improve over time. They need to maintain a 30 to 35 foot bus size in order to maintain their current level of service and that, that proves to be uh, a little tough when you're looking for a fully electric vehicle, just the size of them that exists now. Also, there's significant infrastructure needs that the LRTA has in order to go towards full electrification. The, Mr. Bradley quoted approximately 28 months of infrastructure work that would be needed to their facility um, in order to be able to service the number of electric buses that we're looking at. Uh, they're also looking at fuel cell and propane powered buses as refueling them is much faster and the infrastructure for fuel cell buses is not nearly as costly as full electrification. Overall, this was an excellent 
uh, beginning of a conversation and I invited um, or we invited Mr. Bradley and Mr. Anastas to come back after the full state budget is approved uh, for FY25 so that once they once they have an idea of what the budget is they can share with us their plan for the next year just to try and keep the lines of communication open and and make sure that uh, we're doing what we can to to help them succeed uh, in their mission in our community and the surrounding communities thank you motion to accept the reports as a report to progress by council Jeunesse, second by council russia all in favor say aye opposed motion passes petitions quickly 12.2 miscellaneous james breen senior request installation of a handicap pocket sign at 167 with thorn street motion to refer a transportation engineer for report uh, and recommendation by council noon second by council mercia all in favor say aye opposed motion passes 1213 12 3 miscellaneous Robbie Bennett requests installation of loading zone in a handicapped parking sign on Merrimack Street in front of the Sun Building. Motion to refer to the transportation engineer for a report and recommendation by Councilor Robinson, seconded by Council Scott. Also, fear to say it. I oppose. Motion passes. 12 5, National Grid requests installation of handhole with crushed stone at 155 Middlesex Street. Motion to refer to public hearing on July 9th, 2024 at 7 p.m. by Councilor Gitchia, seconded by Councilor Chow. All the favor say aye. Opposed motion passes. 12.6 TC Systems DBA AT&T request installation of conduit to extend small cell network on Gorm Street. Motion to refer a public hearing on, also on July 9th, 2024 by uh, Councilor EM, seconded by Councilor Dakota. All those in favor say aye. Opposed motion passes. 13 announcements. Councilor EM. Um, the Massachusetts Pirate would like to invite the former and active military to the uh, games that will be taking place on Monday, July 1st, uh, with the proper uh, ID, uh, will be free to enter uh, the game. So there will be a special jersey that will be uh, autographed afterward uh, as a souvenir for all the former active military uh, personnel and families. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Young. Councilor Mercia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The Senior Citizen Subcommittee will be meeting on Thursday, this Thursday here, June 27th. It's an away subcommittee, like the Pirates, we're away. We're going over to the Senior Center with um, Mrs. Gitchia over here to preside over the subcommittee. Um, anybody that's within earshot that is a senior that will be there. The concerns are not just with the senior center, but with your neighborhood. We're going to you, so it's community issues that you're concerned about. Thank you. Thank you. One o'clock. One o'clock. Man, you got something? Yes, uh, uh, my apologies to the council uh, in regards to appointments for the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee. Uh, pursuant to the, the authority vested in me as a city manager, it is a pleasure that I am getting appointing the following persons to serve on the Lowell Sustainability Council. There was an error there. Thank you very much, council, for bringing that to my attention, uh, Councilor Noon. But uh, if it's okay with the council, we'll just be changing that, obviously, to serve on the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging co uh, Committee, if that's okay, just to read that into the uh, minutes of today's meeting. They did about three hours ago, Mr. Manager. Um, and finally, quickly, uh, the mayor's office received an email from Senator Kennedy concerning the home rule petition, uh, how we go forward um, electing officials for uh, school committee members and city councilors uh, that leave before the term ends. Uh, they requested some changes. I forwarded it last night to, uh, when I got it uh, last night, to the city solicitor who was. Uh, just going to get back to us hopefully by the time of the next meeting so we can kick it back and get the ball uh, rolling on it. So, Councilor Janess. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Manager, would you mind just touching real quick on the 4th of July celebrations? Mr. Rochus. Uh, so the fourth is going to be held at La Lasher this year. Uh, there was a press release that went out on Friday. Um, the doors will open at 6 p.m. Um, the fireworks go off at 9.02 precisely. <laughs> um, and then there, I think there's going to be uh, some music, performances, bubbles. McGee is going to be there. Uh, we do have a limit on the amount of people that can attend. So um, UML is going to put out um, very soon they're going to have a link to 
how people can acquire tickets to get in. Uh, there's going to be 300 available seats on the field um, and 450 in the bleachers or in the stadium seats. Council Thank Lee. you very much. Also, uh, just very quickly, um, I just want to mention to the manager and the council, I went by the senior center, and I know Council of Mercy has been having meetings there, but the place looks excellent. The paintings, a lot of paintings have been done, a lot of repairs. So uh, uh, add a boy to everybody that's been involved. Thank you. Council Yum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, quickly, uh, through you to Ms. DeRocho, um, regarding the 4th of July celebration, in response to my motion, it say that the celebration will be at the um, downtown and, uh, and the park, and now we change it to the, uh, the ballpark. So what happened there, just between then and then? Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we were able to, we weren't sure that we were going to be able to acquire La Lasher, and then once we found out that we could, it just seemed like the better venue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so we're joined by Councilor Janessa, by Councilor Leahy. Good night.